everyone, and welcome to this online conference on Israeli national security, brought to you by Haaretz and the Eunice and Soraya Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. The mission of the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies is to promote the study of modern Israel at UCLA and beyond. To that end, the Nazarian Center sponsors courses about Israel for UCLA students, generates and disseminates academic research in the field of Israel studies, organizes frequent public programs, and hosts visiting scholars, writers, and artists. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, our public programming has moved online, and we've been able to reach a worldwide audience. By partnering with Haaretz to organize this conference, we hope to reach even more people and help promote a broader and deeper understanding of Israeli national security and the strategic challenges Israel currently faces. We've identified three major strategic challenges, though there are, of course, others. The first and most immediate is the Iranian nuclear program and what's been called Israel's shadow war with Iran, a covert war that's been taking place for some time now and has become more open recently. There's a growing danger of a full-blown war between Israel and Iran, which would probably also involve the United States, as well as the growing risk that Iran will soon be able to cross the nuclear threshold and become a nuclear armed state, or at least a state with the capability to quickly build a nuclear weapon. While the danger of a nuclear armed Iran preoccupies Israeli policymakers and security officials, there is another danger that is generally receives less attention the danger that the conflict with the Palestinians will become insoluble as the possibility of a two-state solution to the conflict disappears. Finding a way to peacefully and equitably resolve this conflict, or at least reduce it, is Israel's second strategic challenge, and it is no less pressing than Iran's nuclear program. Israel's ability to deal with both of these strategic challenges and others depends in part on its long-standing de facto alliance with the United States, Israel's closest ally. Maintaining bipartisan American support for this alliance at a time of increasing partisan political polarization in the United States is therefore another pressing strategic challenge for Israel. To discuss these three critical challenges and what Israel should do about them, we have assembled an amazing lineup of speakers, including current and former Israeli policymakers and leading experts from Israel and the United States. We will hear from Benny Gantz and Robert Menendez, from Yossi Cohen, Zippy Livni, and Murad Michaeli, and we'll have three panel discussions. I hope you will find these speeches, interviews, and panels to be interesting, informative, and thought-provoking. I'm sure I will. I'm delighted that the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies has been able to partner with Haaretz to bring you this conference. I'd like to thank the team at Haaretz, especially Aluf Ben, Amir Tibon, Omer Schubert, and Nufa Chen, and my team at the Nazarian Center, particularly Mora Resnik and Jane Matusovskaya, for all their hard work in organizing this conference. I'd also like to thank our donors for funding this conference and all the speakers for generously giving their time and sharing their expertise and insights. And now I will turn over to Aluf Ben, Haaretz's Editor-in-Chief. Thank you, Dov. I'm happy to open the first conference on Israel's national security. And I want to thank our partners from the UCLA Yunus and Soraya Nazarian Center for Israel Studies for making this happen, along with my colleagues at Haaretz. Our conference takes place when new governments are leading both the United States and Israel. The Biden administration and the Bennett government are struggling with similar challenges, shaky public support and the overbearing shadow of the populist predecessors, Trump and Netanyahu. And both Bennett and Biden are trying to shape new responses to old challenges, or at least to show new diplomatic styles. We're approaching November 29th, that is the anniversary of the UN partition plan in Palestine and the Palestine Day at the United Nations, and now also the planned day for resumption of talks with Iran on the nuclear deal with the superpowers. Are we facing the crossing of nuclear threshold in Iran, 
or have we, as former Prime Minister Ehud Barak had stated, already approached it? What does it mean to Israel's national security? Is there still anything to talk about with the Iranians? Are we facing a bombing or bomb dilemma for Israel? And what would be the boundaries of a possible Israeli policy with or without American support? The current regional and, and global focus on Iran's nuclear development and power projection is the key Middle Eastern issues. The divider of nations and alliances overshadows the Palestinian issue. Prime Minister Bennett indicated that he has no interest in pursuing a deal or even talks with the Palestinian Authority leadership. And presiding over this unprecedented right-left coalition that for the first time includes an Arab party, Bennett plays a very delicate balancing act. Uh, while passing the budget is giving him some breathing space and time uh, to maneuver. Bennett has tried to please both political ends. The left by allowing small, mostly economic gestures to the Palestinian Authority and allowing some ministers to meet President Abbas. And the right, his former support base, by approving new settlement construction, declaring civil society organizations in the PA as terrorist groups, and uh, objecting the reopening of the US consulate in Jerusalem, closed by Trump, uh, which served as a thinly veiled embassy to the Palestinians in the past. Can Bennett proceed and go on with this tightrope dance, giving little while expecting the relative quiet security situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians to prevail? Or would the inevitable dilemmas, conflicts and hard decisions on Gaza, on the future of the Palestinian Authority after Abbas, on Israel's settlement expansion, are merely delayed and will return in the third act, if not the second act? The consulate disagreement notwithstanding, the Biden administration has shown strong support for Israel's new government. Biden avoided Netanyahu after he took office, and, uh, but he was happy to host Bennett at the White House and enjoy a joint photo with Bennett in Glasgow at the climate conference, where they both attended. Obvious ideological gaps exist between the former CEO of the Yesha Council, the settler lobby group, and the current leader of the American left wing. But are they merely swept under the rug in order to keep Netanyahu away from office? Or will they implode in some way and harm the relationship, as we see in the disagreement over the consulate, over the proposed agreement with Iran, and other issues? Could Biden, with his perceived weakness, both domestically and internationally, and his foreign policy focus on the de facto Cold War with China, would he have the energy or political interest to push America again into the Israeli-Palestinian arena? Or would, Bennett, Biden, or would Biden suffice with Bennett avoiding any game changers and simply keeping the issue away from the American radar for as long as deep as possible? Netanyahu sided firmly with the Republicans, and particularly President Trump, imitating his style. But his opponents failed and successors. Uh, Netanyahu sided firmly with the Republicans, and particularly with President Trump, imitating his style, but Netanyahu's opponents and uh, successors so far have failed to build similar rapport with the Democratic Party, where a vocal left wing strongly opposes the current US support, and particularly its military aid to Israel. Is Israel at risk of losing an even bigger chunk of its American support base, or can it bring back some bipartisanship into the relations? Iran and the Palestinians, the future of the American alliance with Israel are the key issues driving Israel's policy and national security agenda, and obviously will be the focus of our conference today. And I wish all of us a fruitful, challenging, and hopefully surprising day. Thank you. I'm delighted to address you in this forum. As a young soldier, my first ever operational mission was guarding Egyptian President Sadat convoy during his first historic visit to Israel. Today, I am serving as Israel's Minister of Defense during a time when we have peace with Egypt and Jordan and a groundbreaking normalization agreements with the UAE, Bahrain and Morocco. This is time when I am more hopeful than ever that we can multiply the success of these accords. These agreements 
are critical so that the region may flourish and so that we may stand strong against common threats. These threats are all originated and coordinated by Iran, which is a global and regional challenge, as well as a challenge to the state of Israel. Iran sees itself as a hegemon, systematically equipping terror armies and exporting its radical ideology, weapons, funds, and manpower across the Middle East. They target economic resources, as we saw in the Aramco attack case. Disrupt global trade, as we saw in the Mercer Street attack case. Harm democratic processes, as we see in the Iraqi elections. And dismantle regime, as we see in, the, in Lebanon and in Syria. Everything that Iran is doing now is taking place without nuclear canopy. Imagine what will happen if Iran reaches a nuclear threshold. I can support an agreement that will be broader, stronger, and longer, taking Iran back, dismantling its current capabilities, and placing effective inspections on its sites and on its weapons production. Iran possesses a serious threat to global peace and potential existential threat to Israel. We will continue to act, ensuring that Iran will never achieve military nuclear capabilities. <coughs> This conference is not only dealing with the challenges, but also remarks the opportunities that we have in the region. One of them is strengthening the ties between Israel and its neighbors. When I met Palestinian Authority Chairman Abu Mazen, I told him that regardless of our differences, nobody on either side is going anywhere and we will have to live side by side. As I see it, we have an opportunity to build trust between Israel and the Palestinians, taking measures on the ground that will contribute to security, stability, and economic, and economic prosperity, steps that will benefit both sides. At a time of both great optimism and increasing threats in the region, the international community, led by the United States, EU, and partners in the Middle East, should invest in their goodwill and resources in improving Palestinian life and economy. This will contribute to peace and stability and enable us to continue building the foundation for our common future. Having discussed our challenges and opportunities, we must remember that Israel's ability to both defend itself and to seek peace lies in the resilience of our society. The Israeli government is committed to this issue. Israel's social resilience, partnership with the international friends of, and the strong bonds with the Jewish communities around the world will guarantee our future in this complex region. Thank you. I want to welcome Yossi Cohen, former director of the Mossad and former head of the National Security Council in Israel and currently the head of SoftBank in Israel. Welcome, Yossi. Good morning, sir. Thank you. We're approaching November 29th, the presumed date of uh, resume talks between the superpowers and Iran on a, maybe a new nuclear agreement. Is there still anything to talk about with the Iranians or are, or are they already breaking out away from any supervision, safeguards, straight to the bomb? Well, the current situation actually is um, absolutely complicated since there is an agreement that the Iranians do not respect and there are some um, achievements that has to be have to be achieved in the negotiations if to be resumed by the powers in Iran. Like what? 
The Iranians today are enriching because they can enrich. Both bunkers that are holding uh, advanced centrifuges of a more advanced um, uh, type that had been in the past are rotating and enriching uranium to the level that the Iranians decide. This is something, in my opinion, that has to be absolutely seized and, and, and stopped. And I think when we discuss the cycle of the nuclear fissile materials, this is something that has to be eventually rearranged or, in my... Broken apart. In, in a way. Broken apart from the entire agreement, because I, I believe that broken apart completely, I mean, to destroy, yeah. the, to destroy the facilities is something that has to be uh, done by this agreement completely. Because of what? Iran today enriches because it can and because of its own decision. If the agreement would have taken all its capabilities and not their willingness, they are willing to have a nuclear bomb. Let's say they had it. That's a different story. But let's assume they are willing to have a nuclear bomb. Since they have the capabilities to enrich and since they're holding the entire um, physical materials cycle, as we call it, they can decide themselves when and for how, but is it, but for how long or how much But isn't it too late, as former Prime Minister Barak suggested, that it's already too late and that we have to learn to live with the possibility of uh, an Iranian nuclear bomb in the no, near future? No, I think it's never late. Actually, first, we have to all the time put, put statements in, in front of our eyes. One is that Israel will never let the Iranians to hold a nuclear military nuclear capability. This is something that we have to adapt ourselves in our new can Israel really time. Can Israel go it alone without superpower cover, without American support? I think that Israel should have the ability to fight this uh, aspect alone, like we did twice in the past. I mean, when Iraqis have decided to go onto the nuclear military pass, uh, path, we have attacked it. When the Syrians did the same with the help of North Korea, we did the same. I but in a much less sophisticated program with one, with one major facility rather than bunkers and thousands of... I, I, I assume that it's going to be complicated militarily, uh, operationally, but I don't think that it is impossible. But I think that if the State of Israel will decide to get, if I may read of this program, that the Iranians do not really need for them uh, protection, we can do it and we will have to do it. And, uh, but you know, sev several of your predecessors, and the, and the head of Mossad, like Efraim Alevi and uh, Tamir Pardo, and I, and I would assume that the late Mayor Dagan would have agreed, criticized Netanyahu's decision to convince or to, to convince Trump to let go, to leave the nuclear agreement three I, years ago, I, and that and they argued that and they and they're not alone. Argued that this was a major blunder for Israeli right. strategy. I don't think that all the names mentioned um, would have agreed with one political or diplomatic structure uh, towards Iran. I mean, Israeli system is different. I mean, we're very uh, uh, colored, if I may. I mean, in our versions of uh, holding this uh, diplomatic asset. My opinion is, and it was my opinion when I was Deputy Director of the Mossad, when I was, as mentioned, National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister and, of course, Director of the Mossad, that we, as Israelis, should do our utmost to get rid of their capabilities within negotiations. This would be the best, of course, if Iran would come clean. Yeah, but Israel, but Israel's, uh, Israel persuaded the United States uh, to leave the agreement, we had to let shown, the Iranians go we had, on the, we had shown the Americans, and I believe the world within the American society, that Iran lied all the way to the deal. It lied because it was uh, not coming clean with many issues and subjects that were hidden from the world and from us too. That was, by the way, the main target of the so-called the archive, the nuclear archive operation. We had to bring materials from within the military group, from within the group of yeah, but, but you brought materials to prove that Iran is holding better and yeah, but, better but, capabilities but than it, we but, knew. But even if you won the PR, the PR case, still they're enriching uranium more than they did when when the agreement was still there. So this is, you this have a is major true. operational success. This is true, but, but I was honored 
really honored to be one of the prime negotiators by the state of Israel with the P5 plus one when uh, President Obama was the president and my counterparts were negotiating. Susan Rice as national security um, advisor, Wendy Sherman, undersecretary of John Kerry, etc. And we were explaining then, not only to the American allies and colleagues of ours, but to the world entirely, to the P5 plus one and the IEA in Vienna as well, that a good agreement is possible. That a good agreement means close up to a complete shutdown. These two bunkers that you've mentioned, Aluf, this is absolutely right. There is a major question here. Why does Iran enrich? Why do they need enrichment no, but capabilities they do. So, and capacities? So, so they, you, do, they do not. So you had a PR success and you know, and many, many other operations uh, attributed in uh, the foreign media to Israel or to mm -hmm. Mossad or to other, uh, other names of, uh, of uh, and, and euphemisms of Israel right. to destroy this facility, that facility, that centrifuge, to kill uh, that scientist or engineer or whatever, but still they're enriching more uranium. So you may have the, operational success and, and, and strategic, and, and strategic this uh, is such, collapse. Such, this is such a good question because strategic if, failure. You, if you ask, ask yourself, why is it that Iran can enrich? Because of a decision. They can enrich uranium, uranium as they want due to their own decision. Yeah, but they're if not they deterred have, by, but they're not but deterred. If, you know, if you kill one scientist, the others own, are still coming I, to work. If they haven't had their capability to enrich, this would not be the case. My request was, and still today, resuming the talks within, let's say, a few days, is that these two bunkers and the enrichment capability will be dismissed completely. Then there is not a discussion between us and the Americans and the Chinese and the Russians and the three E's and the IEA in Vienna about what's going to be the future of Iran on that sense because the major problem of this agreement is that it has limit in time. And that it leaves it would, it, it the would infrastructure it, in it there. It leaves yeah. infrastructures, not only that. Scientists and their science capabilities are, is growing. Facilities have been, have been improved, both. Natanzan Fordo is not Natanzan Fordo yeah, of 2015. I and th that well, was allowed. Well, this is my argument that with covert action, you cannot just, you know, you, you can, you can uh, damage it, but it not, I, you cannot I, destroy it altogether. You can, you can damage You can kill one and scientist, can, and 10 scientists, 10 scientists, slow. You can, I agree with you, totally. You can damage, you can slow down their capabilities. Every single thing that we had been, according to four reports, doing in Iran is to make sure that they keep enough distance of capabilities, not of willingness, from the bomb. That was it. And then, if we did what we did, and let's say that was in our asset strategic item to do or to keep this distance as it is, I think that we've done it correctly. Up to date, Iran is not closer to the bomb than it was in the past. It is not closer than it was before the agreement. It is not closer because they violent the agreement. This is not the case. It is true that there is all the time a kind of a need on the Iranian strategy understanding to go into more sophisticated facilities, capabilities, and advanced centrifuges so they can enrich uranium better. I think that the world should ask itself one major question. Why is Iran enriching? They do not need any enriched uranium, rather for to use it in a nuclear weapon. And this is something that the State of Israel, National Security Advisor then, um, not, and you not think too that late the, to go you think that the current to the Mossad, I, I opposed and, and, and you, that dramatically. And you think that the current government in Israel is following the same strategy? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as don't far, think that the change as, of far, government as, far as I know, I believe that the state of Israel of two dates, the prime minister, national security advisor to the prime minister of today. He was one um, of your it was, subordinates. It was, it was one of my subordinates, yeah. uh, Dr. Eyal Khulata. Um, they're absolutely updated of the Iranian deeds. And I think that they would run the same strategy as before, saying one thing, 
Iran could never acquire was, but nuclear there, weapon, and instead of Israel will do everything but there in was its a, capabilities to make sure that it will not happen. There was an argument that there was a lot of action, but not a real strategy of how to deal with it in case the agreement fails and so on. In case of the agreement that, that during the Netanyahu government, you were, you know, there was some inner circle it was, of people. I, I, just a little reminder, I yeah. think it is important, uh, Aluf, uh, it was a very long process. I mean, Obama's administration's engagement with Iran was longer than the last term. It was longer than four years. Then we got part of the negotiations. We're trying to make our best influence as in between friends, as in between always America and Israel not conflicting each other, but maybe seeing things differently from different views. And Crystal Ball, are they going to resume, to reach an agreement, a new agreement with Iran? I'm not sure if today is possibilities to reach an agreement, because in Iran there were some changes too. Yeah. Ibrahim Raisi is not the nice face of Iran as uh, Rouhani was. Um, he is much more um, extreme in his uh, uh, regional views than his uh, than his predecessor, and I am I'm not sure that I Iran will agree to run the so, same. So, Crystal Ball, you see type motion without movement? I see motion with a lot of uh, emotion. <laughs> um, and and but I, then again, it falls back to the, to the Israeli decision makers to find out, find a way to deal with it without you know, counting on the superpowers to do the job. The best thing would Israel. be that if Israel and America, which is eventually the best, absolute best friend of the state of Israel ever, will decide together, as President Biden has recently declared. And I was honored to see Mr. Biden myself yeah. on my last month of my term at the director of the Mossad. And it was agreed, not only with me, but with the Prime Minister of Israel afterwards as well, that Iran, to both of us, will never be allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. This is too dangerous for the region, too dangerous for the State of Israel entirely. Do you have uh, aspirations as rumored to be the not next now. Prime Minister? I mean, I'm, I'm, well, you're I'm, now in, I'm in freeze or I'm not in politics today. Yeah. I'm absolutely in business. I invest most of my time to, I would say, to translate Zionism um, into these uh, economical assets that are super important for the, for the prosperity of the state of Israel. And, uh, and this, have, is, this and is what do I do. you think about politics? Not now. Not now. And, uh, you know, there was an issue of uh, present you got from, uh, no, this from no a part billionaire. Of this interview. I think that we discussed national security, not my private life, but... Uh, but did you find a way to give it back, as you said? Yes. Yes, it's, it's over? I hope it's over. I hope. Um, and last but not least, uh, the issue of NSO, uh, a company that sells cyber uh, offensive products, and now declared by the United States to be harmful to American interests. And uh, at the time, it was a lot of talk about how it helped Israel reach out to, you know, to more peaceful relations around the world. Do you see the conflict here? Do you think the Americans think, are I wrong think, in this? I think, I think that this story is um, absolutely sensitive. I know that officially this story has been dealt uh, in the right offices, and I'm, I don't have the uh, <laughs> obligation nor the uh, uh, freedom to discuss this issue, with your permission. I see. Well, thank you, Yossi Cohen, for joining us, and uh, for a very Interesting, though, less than optimistic discussion about uh, Iran and its program. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Thank you very much, Aluf. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, and thank you for joining us for a panel on Iran, Israel, the nuclear file, the negotiations, the biggest story right now in the news in the U.S.-Israel relationship. And when we talk about Israel's strategic challenges, we cannot ignore this one. And we have a great panel for our discussion today. With me in studio, Sima Shine, the head of the Iran program at the INSS here in Israel. Thank you for being with us, Sima. And Amos Arel, a national security correspondent and analyst for Haaretz. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Amos. And via Zoom, Dalia Dasakei of the UCLA Berkel Center and Professor Avner Cohen of the Middlebury Institute. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, we have a lot to discuss. 
Uh, Sima, I want to start with you. A new government here in Israel, looking at the United States, about to enter renewed talks with Iran. What objectives can this government try to achieve? What should be the requests that come up in talks with the American side before these negotiations are renewed? So as you know, uh, Israel is quite worried from just going back. The question is, do you go back to what you go back? And this is, I think, uh, the, the problem. It looks uh, from Israel's point of view that the American administration is eager to uh, put back the Iranian issue in the box and going back to the agreement is, this, is the way to do it. So from Israel's point of view, I think it will be important to see that uh, the US doesn't go for something that is called less for less or uh, less, uh, more for less, meaning more relief of sanctions for less uh, things that Iran will take upon itself on the nuclear sphere. Uh, this is one thing. The other one, which is not less important, is the question of what next? Uh, is it a, an agreement that within several years will be, uh, it will be uh, finished, will the sunset will be within some, uh, several years, or is it going to be a platform for a longer and stronger, as the Biden administration has said at the beginning, that they would prefer to go back and then start negotiations for longer and stronger, which Israel would prefer, of course. Uh, at the end of the day, the main problem, the current main problem today, is uh, that there is an, uh, a, an evaluation in Israel that Iran is just wasting time, trying to win uh, more and more time in order to improve its uh, position with the program, to have more uh, and reach to revenue for 60%, for 20%, and to be in a better leverage vis-a-vis -vis the US, uh, and uh, of course, uh, shortening the timetable for breakout. So I think it's a, a complex of issues that are very worrying Israel, but the good news, I would say, is that Israel, this government has decided to uh, have the dialogue with the US. To engage. In, exactly, in closed rooms and not in the press or in uh, speeches. No, no, we're not gonna see Naftali Bennett flying to Congress. For now. Exactly. And uh, Amos, I'm gonna ask you in a minute about the recent history of this issue and to have near some questions about more far away history. But uh, Dalia, I want to ask you, uh, we, we spoke just with Sima about the new government in Israel. There is also a new government in Iran. What are the objectives for that government uh, when it comes into the nuclear negotiating room now? Yeah, well, uh, this is, uh, thank you for having me, a great session here. Um, the new government is, is certainly more hardline. The nuclear deal is a lower priority. They're much more focused on domestic. Uh, they are, I think, eager to show that they could get more than the previous government under President Rouhani. Of course, we have to caveat all, uh, caveat all this by saying the Supreme Leader, you know, makes the final shots in Tehran. So new governments don't change things as much as, of course, in the case with Israel. Um, but it's clear that they would welcome sanctions relief. They are taking their time, though. Uh, they took many months to get back to negotiations that are going to resume later this month. Uh, the government was elected last June. Um, so they're not rushing into it. They're kind of mimicking the Biden administration that said they weren't going to rush into it. So they're playing that game. Um, and it's clear that they're going to want some new things uh, from this deal, which could make it very difficult. They're particularly interested in sanctions relief, ver verification of sanctions relief. They want some guarantees that the Biden administration or any future administration mm -hmm. in the U.S. is not going to leave the deal again, which, of course, is going to be hard to guarantee in a democracy. Um, but I do think that sanctions relief is still going to be the core issue. And in fact, I, I understand it, the way the deal has been spoken in Iran right now. It's, it's not called the Iran nuclear deal anymore. It's called the sanctions relief deal. So I think they're still, <laughs> um, yes, they have workarounds, but I think they're still interested in getting, even if it's short term boost to their economy, they very much need that. Amos, in 2019, you wrote a column for us at Haaretz proclaiming that the Trump policy of maximum pressure on Iran, which was strongly encouraged at the time by former Prime Minister Netanyahu, has failed. And when, when we're looking today at the situation that Israel is facing with Biden and other allies going back to negotiations and Iran looking for the sanctions relief deal, as Dalia just described it, what is the legacy of Netanyahu and Trump on this issue when we examine it in 2021? 
Well, I'm glad somebody remembers, or at least I'm glad that I sent you a link to that. I, I bookmarked, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Other than that, um, I, I think, yeah, I think history would judge uh, Netanyahu quite harshly on the Iran uh, portfolio. Which was the main issue that he, you know, presented to the world for many years. And there's a huge gap between the rhetoric about Nazi Germany coming back and uh, Iran being uh, the, the, the current version of Nazi Germany and saving the Jews from the Holocaust and what actually materialized. Netanyahu, as we know, applied pressure on Trump to withdraw from the nuclear agreement. This happened in 2018. A year or two later, the Iranians began uh, um, uh, in being in breach of the agreement. And finally, as uh, Sima has mentioned, they moved forward with enriching uh, uranium. Uh, the end result of that is that we're in a much more dangerous situation now than we were a year or two uh, ago. Netanyahu, what he hoped to achieve, I assume, was either that the maximum pressure and maximum sanctions would uh, in the end lead to the collapse of the regime, or that they would be under so much pressure that they would make a mistake, provoke President Trump, and lead to an American attack. And, and then America these, gets the job done for yeah, Israel. None of these scenarios actually materialized, and Iran is where it is uh, right now. Ben it has to deal with, with all that. And on top of everything else, what he's been hinting for quite some time is that Netanyahu not only mis, uh, misread the map, but also he neglected to prepare the IDF for such a scenario, meaning that for quite some time, the IDF was not, especially the Israeli Air Force, were not, was not preparing for the military option, for striking um, unilaterally at uh, Iranian uh, nuclear sites. Now, there's an ongoing discussion whether that was realistic to begin with. We all remember the Barack Netanyahu government in 2011, 2012. We remember the generals resisting the, uh, the whole idea. But, I mean, most people in Israel would agree that there needs to be at least an alternative, that somebody needs to work on those plans in case the worst case uh, scenario happens. It turns out that the IDF is quite um, some time behind this option, and now we're finding ourselves in, in a situation where we don't have many alternatives. In the end, Israel could, um, you know, complain a lot and whine a lot and, and, and try to affect the American positions, but I don't think that we have much leverage over the negotiations. Avner, after covering that recent history with Amos, I want to ask you if we go a little more uh, back in time and we look at a broader uh, view of this, what would it mean for Israel if Iran crossed the threshold apart from the threats? Because it would also mean losing a monopoly on this issue in the region. Well, the Israeli monopoly is terribly important, is invisible, but at the same time it's terribly important in terms of the uh, posture, the position, the place of Israel in the Middle East. Uh, losing it in the eyes of essentially all Israeli government, from Barak, including Bennett and Netanyahu, would, would undermine Israeli position in the region a great deal. Uh, for a long, long time, I thought that the issue was not uh, about Iran gaining the bomb or not, but it was a struggle about the distance that, allowed, that Iran would be allowed and ultimately would be pushing itself to be from the bomb. And I think what happened from 2019, actually there was a year of a little lull, a little hesitation on the side of Iran after Trump uh, left the, the agreement. But from 2019, Iran was moving fast in a variety of areas, in particular in the area of fission materials, to diminish the achievement and to undermine the, the achievement of the imperfect uh, GSPO, the agreement, the Iran deal of 2015. The result is that I don't think that Iran is on its way to have a break, breakout towards the bomb. I think they're sneaking towards the bomb. They're trying by this salami uh, method to cut slice by slide and to be getting closer and closer to the threshold. Uh, the fact that they have significant amount of uh, uranium, 60%, some 25% and, and much more 20%. And essentially the world is quiet about it. Uh, it was done uh, openly and they're moving and there is quiet, they are, they are, they are essentially, and there is, no, there is no any methods to look and to monitor and to verify Iran and its progress in the areas of weaponization, militarizations and all that, that's create a very dangerous situation. I don't think that Iran will have the bomb 
anytime very soon, but it creates a very dangerous situation. Sima, I want to go back to you and ask that in light of everything we just heard from Dalia and Amos and Avner, what is the better scenario for Israel? A new deal that it doesn't like or a failure to reach a deal? And then we're not even sure what the consequences are. So first of all, I have to say that, uh, as you know, it's not, it doesn't depend on Israel. True. And in this case, and I completely agree with, uh, with Dalia, it doesn't uh, uh, depend on the US as well. Uh, it looks, and uh, as uh, I'm following the Iranian issue for a long time, it looks for me that uh, Iran actually doesn't want to go back. What Iran, of course, if Iran could get the relief of all sanctions. We just uh, get, got yesterday an article in the um, uh, newspaper of the government and has put the demands before the Americans. And one of them is remove, a removal of all sanctions during, from Obama to Trump and today. Nuclear related or no, all, all sanctions? No, sanctions, okay, of good course. Luck. And they say the, this uh, issue of uh, terror and the human rights and others, that's not the issue. All sanctions that have been put on Iran should be removed. Nevertheless, of course, Iran should be compensated for what it has uh, suffered in the last two years almost three years. So I think the, uh, what, if I'm looking on, on the terms that Iran is putting on the table, one could say it's only bargaining position, but I uh, intend to believe what Iranians are saying, that they mean it. And if they mean it and they want to bring to the table those demands, uh, also the demand not, uh, of the US not to, to, to leave the agreement any, any time in the future, all these demands are impossible for the, for the American administration. So I do think that we are much, much more in, uh, close to a scenario where nothing will happen uh, in Vienna around the table. Of course, it will not happen in this uh, meeting. Iran will do everything is needed in order to have a second meeting or a third meeting, uh, playing on the desire of the Biden administration to have an agreement. But at the end, it will be, and I think even the Americans are starting to say, Secretary Blinken has said, uh, there will be at a, a point in time in the future, and it's not far in the future, that the agreement will, there will be no uh, need to go, no uh, desire to go back to any agreement and it will not be possible. So from that point of view, I think that uh, the question, what is better for Israel, it's a good question, but I don't think it is on, on the table. Israel, I think, um, would prefer to have, a, even if, it, if, you, if the US goes back to the agreement, to have a, a, a beginning of a, of a commitment of, on the side of the Iranians to have a, a next phase of, a, of dialogue, which I don't think will happen. So uh, we are really catched in a situation where nothing is good. Not the Iran, that, uh, neither Iran going, uh, continuing with its program as uh, Avner has just mentioned, which is very uh, Sneaking dangerous. to the bomb, as Sneaking to the bomb, exactly. Neither the other position that Iran will get relief of everything and will, uh, so, and, and the agreement will be, uh, the sunset will be in uh, several years. So we are really in a catch-22. <laughs> Amos, in the past, we saw, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of arguments within the Israeli leadership, mostly between political leadership and, the, uh, you know, security, intelligence chiefs around the Iran policy. Are we seeing something similar happening today or not yet? A divergence between the elected officials and the intelligence and security chiefs? Not just yet. Uh, I think that when you look at, at uh, Bennett's uh, positions, at least uh, the outspoken uh, views that he expresses in different interviews and speeches and so on, it's not very different from not what Netanyahu has said, minus the Holocaust. Uh, Talk. Without the exaggeration. Exactly. Uh, but I think that the change mainly is about the fact, and, and this has to do with everything Bennett does, is that he's very different. His conduct is very different. He, he comes from a, a party that has uh, six seats. He's not, you know, he, he's um, not an autocrat in, in any way, and he needs to govern through uh, uniting the different parties and so on. So he cannot afford to fight with the generals or the Mossad or Shin Bet chiefs or anything like that. So it's all about more of a freedom of expression, if you'd like, and having the professional, uh, professional level talk uh, directly to power and tell um, Bennett and others 
uh, what this is about and what they actually say. Uh, the best example for that was in the last days of Netanyahu when he sent uh, former chief of Mossad Cohen and uh, the chief of staff Kohavi and others to Washington, but he told them that they were forbidden to discuss possible negotiations between Iran and the US because this is something that Israel is not yeah, willing to going, live with. Going to Washington but not talking about the most important issue with the exactly. new Biden administration. And this is why Kohavi avoided the mission altogether. I think, uh, I'm joking, but uh, some people have said that the escalation in Gaza was meant to prevent Kohavi <laughs> from actually needing to go under these orders uh, to Washington. Uh, but other than that, I think there's more, more room for discussion uh, right now. Um, there might be, um, I think, a debate beginning between Gantz and Bennett. Bennett might be more of a hardliner. We could see that with uh, Rob Mali, the special envoy uh, on Iranian and affairs. He came to Israel and Bennett said, Israel. I'm not going to meet him. Yeah, yeah. So the Bennett, people Even around though Bennett explained. the according protocol, he doesn't have to. Yes, True. but I think yeah. it was a... In a way, it was a subtle message that yeah. Bennett is trying to, to, to keep a distance between him and this issue and, and not to look as if he's supporting uh, the, nego the renewed negotiations between Iran and, um, and uh, the United States other, and, and the European uh, states. Other than that, I think that the, at one point or another, Bennett may be tempted to be proactive about Iran. He may be looking for his legacy. You have to remember that in two years' time, it will be Lapid as the, the, the uh, next prime minister if the coalition holds. The clock is ticking. Yeah, and Bennett has to, it's not enough to improve the everyday lives of the Israelis. When he thinks of, his, of himself in terms of historic proportions and so on, he's looking for a legacy. And the danger there is that he might be tempted to do something that Netanyahu didn't do. We're still quite far away from that, but I think that we need to, 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 to consider that as a possibility. Yeah, politicians looking for a legacy always comes with some, uh, some uh, price to pay. Some warning signs. Dalia, I want to turn to you. We've talked a lot now with Amos and Sim on the Israeli side. A question on the Biden administration. When we hear Secretary of State Blinken saying that other options are on the table, when we hear Biden saying Iran is not going to have a nuclear weapon, period, are they bluffing or is there really a military alternative from the United States side? Look, uh, I think it's important to note that the priority is still getting back and getting Iran back into compliance with this deal. That's priority one. And I think it's important to note that uh, Biden, President Biden inherited a very bad hand uh, as, um, I hope my internet isn't going here, um, as I think almost laid out. So uh, instead of when Trump withdrew from the deal in 2018, instead of a better deal, um, and a stronger deal uh, and getting Iran more contained, you have um, no better deal and a less contained Iran. And I agree with Avner's concerns about Iran's current nuclear advances, but it's not exactly sneaking out. These are in full sight. Um, the nuclear deal did contain its program. We had incredibly intrusive inspections. We had uh, most of its uranium enrichment shipped out of the country. Um, and we had a lid on the program, not perfect, but we had a lid on it. We do not have any constraints or very few constraints at the moment. So I think the Biden administration's priority is going to be to get back to some semblance of nuclear constraint diplomatically. Now, um, as I said earlier, I think there's a lot of barriers to getting there now, more than there was back in 2015. Uh, there's a lot more mistrust on the Iranian side. They feel they, you know, they fulfilled their side of the deal. They actually were complying with it. We, we, the United States, left. Um, they are asking for more things now. As Seema said, many of these things are not realistic. Uh, it could be just starting positions. Um, but you know, I think there are reasons to believe there's still a chance. I've been quite pessimistic actually since the U.S. withdrawal that we can salvage this thing. Um, and certainly the more Iran advances in the program, the more difficult that will be. Uh, but the fact that they're still willing to go to the negotiating table, um, the fact that you may get less regional resistance, um, Israel will certainly be concerned, as I think is expressed here, um, but the rest of the region is starting to de-escalate with Iran on all kinds of regional issues, uh, Yemen and others. Uh, so you may actually find less regional resistance more support for containing this because the region saw what happened when maximum pressure was 
uh, enforced on Iran. Iran lashed out and it became a very dangerous neighborhood, oil tankers getting hit, etc. So I think a lot of players in the region and the United States does not want to see a repeat of that. Um, but it's going to be hard, no question about it. That's an understatement. Uh, uh, Avner, uh, I want to turn to you uh, and ask you, let's say that we do see the Iranians uh, pushing through and uh, sneaking, as you described it. Do you think at some point this could lead to a change in Israel's uh, strategy of ambiguity on the nuclear file, which you have written a lot about over the years? It's difficult to see it in the foreseeable future. Foreseeable future meaning uh, short of Iran test a nuclear device, which I think is very unlikely. I think Iran has somebody to imitate and to follow, and they have learned it pretty well. I think they would like to be in a position to have all the components, all the requirements very, very close, not just visual material, but also weaponization and militarization of the program to be in the distance that would not be known by others exactly, but assumed to be maybe weeks away from the bomb. I'm not saying days, but weeks away from the bomb. And to be comfortable around that. And I believe that uh, before Iran goes to a test, and I believe that this is the major difference between them and North Korea. North Korea wanted very much to make a test, to make a visible change in a statement and to create a situation that it's clear and understood by everybody. I don't think that's the case with Iran. In Iran, there is a great deal of ambiguity, in part because there is the fatwa, which for some people against nuclear weapons, it's real. For some people, it's pretense. But there is, there is no consensus about it. So even internally, I think it's better for them to shorten the distance from the bomb, to sneak as close as they can, uh, and to push it in a situation that it will be difficult to negotiate over that distance they are getting closer and closer without doing the test. And I believe that the Israeli interest ultimately would be to keep Israeli restraints as long as Iran does not make that kind of overt move. So in response to your question, I do not see in the immediate foreseeable future any change in the Israeli position unless something very dramatic happened. So we're speaking a lot about the nuclear issue, but when we talk about Iran as a strategic threat challenge to Israel, it's not just that. And I want to talk to both of you, Sima and Amos, about this. Amos, first of all, we saw some events in recent uh, days that show again the uh, potential damage that Iran can cause in the regional aspect. We saw uh, attacks in Iraq and in Syria, and there has been some disappointment in Israel around the American response to these events. Can you elaborate a bit? Yes, there's quite a lot of frustration. Uh, most of this is going on behind the scenes. You will not uh, in this government uh, term will you hear uh, Israeli senior officials uh, attacking the United States publicly over its conduct in the region. But when you talk to the senior officials, whether the, from the government or from the IDF, uh, you can hear quite a lot of disappointment about what's going on recently. There were two attacks, one in Tanif, the American base which is closer to the Jordanian and Iraqi borders in eastern Syria. Uh, we were told that a friendly state, so to speak, uh, gave them a prior warning about a possible attack and that the Americans decided to evacuate their troops and when Iranian uh, drones hit, uh, nobody was hurt, but uh, nothing happened. There was no retaliation from the American side. Then uh, a week or two later, there was the attack, probably an assassination attempt or at least a message being sent by Shiite uh, uh, Iraqi militias, uh, the attack on the prime minister's uh, home. And then again, America did nothing except for expressing its, um, the fact that it was worried about the situation. So what the Israelis uh, basically are saying is this is going too far. It's one thing that you're willing to discuss uh, resuming negotiations with the Iranians uh, about the nuclear deal. It's another thing that you actually um, uh, refuse to show any kind of force or flex your muscles or do anything. The Americans have tried to, to tell Israel that there's, it's, this is no big deal. And they tried to calm the Israelis down by 
for once, uh, one thing they did was send a marine unit to practice with the IDF at the Negev. Another uh, 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 naval exercise uh, that was announced last week. Because there were some Arab states. Yeah, right? and Israelis were surprised that the Americans, that the Fifth Fleet actually uh, uh, decided to make this public. But there was an announcement regarding the Red Sea. And again, this is, um, some analysts are saying, well, this is a sign that they, the Americans are supporting Israel and not tough they're against committed, Iran. And so they're committed, they're serious. Yeah, but I, I don't think that the Israeli general are buying this and I think that like their counterparts in Saudi Arabia and in Iraq and in the Gulf states are all um, beginning to realize that there's a change in the American attitude towards the region. Part of this is the famous pivot that uh, President Obama talked about a decade ago about moving American interests to uh, uh, the Far East, to uh, uh, East Asia, dealing with China and so on. Part of this is, is the general agenda now on the table and uh, the, the Israelis call it the three C's. It's uh, climate, uh, China and COVID. Uh, everything else is less interesting for the Americans and you hear people in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem being more and more worried about this outcome. Mm -hmm. And Sima, talking on the regional picture, we're also seeing some interesting and contrasting signs about talks between Iran and Arab countries, including some of the Gulf countries that have gotten so close to Israel. How much of a concern is that in Jerusalem these days? Um, I think, first of all, uh, I think it's an, an interesting phenomena. It's not a new one. Actually, Rouhani started with the dialogue with the Saudis, and this government in uh, Iran continues. Uh, it falls within a strategy that uh, the uh, Raisi government is trying to portray, that they will uh, put a major emphasis on relations with neighboring countries. Of course, it's important also economically. They have borders with Turkey, with, uh, with, Saudi, with, uh, the Saudi, uh, with um, Iraq, and they want to have economic relations with those countries uh, through the border, also to uh, circumvent sanctions if it's possible. So I think um, what we see now in the region is an interesting uh, development. Not everything falls within the same uh, uh, the same camp. On one hand, we see Ira Iran um, continuing the dialogue with the uh, Emirates, there was uh, with the Saudis, uh, trying to come to terms on some issues, but it's difficult. I mean, the problems are there. The Yemen issue is there. I think it's very difficult. On the other hand, we see uh, I Iran having a lot of problems. In Iraq, uh, the last uh, uh, elections, the result of the last elections are very much against the interest of Iran. The militias are less powerful from the point of view of uh, members of parliament than they were in the previous one, and this is something that uh, bothers the Iranians. On the, in Lebanon, we see also a problem. Hezbollah is still the one who who is deciding every issue in, Iran, in Lebanon. But at the same time, people are going to the street, are yelling against Hezbollah, against Iran. Uh, so I, I think, uh, and in Syria as well. I mean, Syria was a project that Iran was planning X, it is less than X they wanted. I mean, not only in the, in the nuclear, and not only in the military one, also in the economic one, which the Russians are taking the upper end. So I think, the picture is a mixed one. There are things that are uh, uh, showing uh, an improvement in uh, the way the, the region sees uh, Iran. At the same time, they have a lot of problems. And I think for Iraq is something to watch. It's not only the fact that uh, in the election they, they lost. It is also the fact that the current uh, prime minister, we don't know who will be the next pre uh, uh, prime minister, but the current one was trying to open more and more to the Arab Sunni countries and to a little bit balance the Iranian uh, influence. And I think this is something that worries Iran. So the picture from Jus Jerusalem is also a mixed one. And I think uh, the issue of relations of the Abraham Accords the, that uh, we are a year la later, I think they were not, uh, it's interesting that in spite of the Accords, Iran decided to go and negotiate with those countries, accepting in a way the fact that they are in, uh, in agreement with Israel, normalization, and the uh, other hidden relations with uh, Saudis. So uh, the picture is a mixed one. There is a, a concern of what is, will happen, but I don't think that in any time Israel was thinking 
people that are dealing with this issue were thinking that um, relations with the Emirates and with Bahrain will, uh, <laughs> will uh, enable Israel to attack Iran from those countries. Nobody was thinking in those terms. It was important to, to legitimize their relations with Israel and to make them public, but no one, everybody is saying Iran was the cause. Iran is a common interest, but it wasn't the cause. Thank you. And uh, Dalia, turning to you and uh, continuing a bit of the discussion we started here with Sima about Iran's relations with other countries, how significant is the recent agreement that we all read about between Iran and China? Oh, yes. Well, I think just like all regional players are hedging, uh, that's what, what players do. I completely agree with Sima's analysis. Um, uh, Iran also is hedging, and, and this isn't new with the current government. This has been a long-standing uh, evolution of stronger uh, Iranian-Chinese ties. Uh, but I think, you know, we shouldn't exaggerate the strength of this so-called strategic alignment, a new strategic agreement. Um, certainly, uh, Iran is looking east, the new government in particular. It's part of their resilience economy strategy. Uh, get, finding workarounds from the Western economic pressure, particularly from the U.S. Um, but it, you know, China's partners in the region, its priority partners, are still Sunni Arab countries. They import uh, most of their oil from Iraq and Saudi Arabia, not Iran. So um, it's still an important party for China, but China's also balancing a lot of different interests, just like the United States is. So I don't think we should read this as kind of a new axis aligned against us. And I think the United States still has a lot of advantages in the region when it comes to China, and we don't have to compete in every sphere. Um, I just want to say one thing on the pivot, because almost mentioned it. Um, it gets a lot of play. It's been talked about for years. Uh, I think some members of this administration in Washington believe they are actually executing the pivot now. Um, the recent agreement in, with Australia is evidence of that. Uh, but I think, you know, we also shouldn't exaggerate that either. Um, there's no question across the political spectrum in Washington, there's an interest of doing less, not more in the Middle East. There's a lot of fatigue over 20 years of like, very costly wars with very little payoff. Uh, Afghanistan was the most recent example, um, uh, tragically. Uh, so I think there is an interest in disengaging to some extent, but we also have to look at reality. Uh, the U.S. still has, uh, give or take, about 50,000 forces in the region, still historically high levels. U.S. aid packages to partners have not changed. You have multi-billion dollar packages, including to the UAE, to execute the, the Abraham Accords negotiated under Trump administration. Uh, and, uh, and aid to Egypt continues, to, despite some debates about little bits of, of you know, $130 million out of their $1.3 billion of aid uh, over human rights. But pretty much it's business as usual. So um, I know there's perceptions that the U.S. is turning its back, that it's not responding to every attack. Keep in mind, Iraq is a very sensitive country, a very sensitive moment. The U.S. has to think very carefully about responding with force. Is that even what the current Iraqi government that's quite supportive of the United States would want? Um, is that in the interest of either country? I think these are big questions. So I don't think we should read the U.S. not responding to every provocation by Iran as um, our turning the back on the region. There's just different ways of approaching the region. Military is one uh, tool, but it's not the only tool. Well, we'll see how uh, the generals who uh, brief Amos uh, will respond to this argument. Uh, Avner, turning to you, uh, and again with more historical question that I find personally very interesting what you will answer. When you examine the Iranian program and the steps that they have made, and then you look at the Israeli program that you've studied so much over the years, did they learn anything from us? Can you see some things that are similar or mistakes that they learned from and they executed better? I think a great deal. You know, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they illegally translated my book and to Farsi, <laughs> somebody gave me an article. Illegally meaning you did not get the copyright and, the, and all without the... Without buying the copyright, without anything, just did it <laughs> illegally. Uh, somebody got me a copy. Um, I think they've learned a great deal in their own version. They also learned a great deal from the North Korean case. And I think they would like very much to have their own case and their own precedent. I think they would like, you know, obviously 
they have limitations that Israel did not, did, did never, never accepted, did not have. One is being party to the non non-proliferation treaty to the NPT. But I can see a situation that they, at one point, because of their lack of interest in getting a new, a new, a new deal. I mean, that's the thing that uh, other members of this panel did not emphasize so much. I think that their interest in the deal is simply diminishing. They don't believe it serves so much their interest. I think they are able to do a great deal in terms of the econ economy with their sanctions. And I think they realize that Biden is, is, which is true, is inward president, that he has less and less interest in foreign issues, definitely in the Middle East. And he is not going, unless they're going to cross the line by, by testing, which they're not going to do, he is really reluctant to take any actions. One thing that I can see in that kind of historical, but also future-oriented context is, there could be a situation that can even withdraw from the NPT and yet assign to the CAN, to the prohibition, to the treaty, to the new treaty that all the nuclear power reject and dismiss of the prohibitions of nuclear weapons. In other words, they would emphasize, we are not into acquiring nuclear weapons. We're going to sign that treaty, but we are, we are discriminated by the NPT. The situation is different and we are leaving the NPT. I don't think it will happen anytime soon, but I can think it's a possibility. Because, because one of the issues that I think they see is that the Biden administration provide much less support to the non-proliferation regime and to the issue of the NPT. He simply is less interested in that. Of course, he would like to keep it, but he is ready to take actions and to, 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 to show it by deed much less, uh, possibly even less than the Trump administration. And I think the Iranians are watching in the sea all that. So I think the situation is quite dark. And uh, it's, I think the Iranians the Iranian are having much more cards than the IC. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's not a nice uh, situation. And I was uh, watching uh, Sima nodding here and uh, you guys seem to be in agreement. Uh, Sima, how does Israel live with the kind of scenario that Avner just painted where it's, Iran doesn't have a bomb, but it's clearly a nuclear state? I think from, uh, from Israel's point of view, and not only, uh, Iran was uh, in uh, weeks, as Avner has said, weeks from a bomb, um, is uh, dangerous the same as if they have a bomb. It's not declared the same way, but it is uh, dangerous the same. Because at the end of the day, what does it mean to have a nuclear cap military nuclear ca capability? It means you can uh, threaten the other side uh, with conventional uh, military. Uh, 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 you, have, you have better them. cards to play. Exactly. So even being some weeks from a bomb, uh, they don't have to pay the price that they would will pay once they have a nuclear test. Uh, at the same time, do, they will have the same leverage vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel uh, when it comes to a conventional uh, conflict. So I think uh, from Israel's point of view, it is the same. And that's the reason that uh, the difference between, one of the reasons, be, the difference between Israel and the US. The US is saying, we will not allow Iran to have a nuclear bomb. Israel is asking to have, to have a commitment. We will not allow Iran to be close to the possibility to have a nuclear bomb. And this is a huge difference. That's the whole story right there. And yeah. most continuing on what Avner and Sima just described, where does the military capability of Israel stand today, as much as we can say? And how does it compare to the discussions that you described of 10 years ago? As I mentioned, I'm not sure that Israel was that close to being capable of bombing Iranian nuclear sites and achieving something uh, a decade ago. There was this ongoing discussion, but then the, at the end, both Netanyahu and Barak, who was then his defense minister, hesitated for different reasons, but no order was given to the army. Um, apparently, during the last five or six years, the IDF and especially the Air Force were busy with other plans and other uh, military activity. Uh, we know that the government has decided to allocate more funds uh, to uh, this um, Iranian military option, and we know that some of the money was actually earmarked for uh, the IDF in order for it to, um, um, to advance its preparations, uh, to be begin uh, exercises and, and, and so on. This will take time. 
But even then, we have to look at the operational situation, which means that Iran is actually more prepared for an attack because its anti-aircraft systems have improved, and because some of these sites are now much deeper underground than they were 10 years ago. And on top of everything else, there's the strategic discussion. How will the international community react? What will this do to Israel's relationship with Western European countries, but more than anything else, with uh, Washington? How would the Biden, uh, Biden administration react? I think that it's not really in the cards and, right and now. And how would Iran react? Yeah, also? of course. And, and maybe that's the, maybe the, the worst, we, we should mention the worst uh, last. Uh, Iran has not been building Hezbollah's military arsenal for uh, more than 20 years uh, just for the for the sake of uh, pleasure i mean this is in the end this is the gun that will uh, will shoot uh, uh, towards the end of the play and if israel does decide to attack uh, there are more than 100,000 rockets and missiles and mortar bombs that may be used against israel this doesn't mean the destruction of israel this doesn't mean the end of the zionist state but it will be a much more dangerous war than anything we've encountered since the uh, Yom Kippur War of 1973. So I think if Bennett or somebody after Bennett would be faced with that dilemma, he needs to consider all these aspects. And I'm not too sure that any Israeli uh, leader would rush to a decision to strike the Iranian sites. That, that's correct, but I have to also say the other side of the coin. And Please the other do. side, And the other side is that it will be very difficult for any prime minister in Israel to ignore a situation where Iran is reaching the point where it will have. I mean, uh, I, I agree all the reasons that were said by Amos, of no question, but uh, I think uh, on the other side, it will be very difficult. And um, I don't know who will be the prime minister at that time, but I think he will be, um, he will not want to take upon himself what uh, Amos has said at the beginning, the legacy for the future and to be the one who allowed Iran at the end of the day to get to that point. Well, it's in the impossible dilemma for everyone. And right now what yeah. we're seeing uh, Bennett mostly do is uh, say, look what I inherited from Netanyahu. Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably has a good point. Uh, Dalia, I, I want to go to you now and ask, continuing on the question to Amos, do the Iranians believe Israel could actually strike them? I think so. I, I mean, look, Iran has been building these asymmetric capabilities, the missile arsenal that almost referred to uh, uh, through Hezbollah, through its own indigenous development, um, its proxies, the non-state actors, not always doing what Iran would like, but still a very important lever. Um, you see their maritime capabilities and, of course, their nuclear development. Is, is not just because they want to bomb for the bomb's sake or prestige. It is another part of their asymmetric uh, arsenal to be able to offset the overwhelming conventional superiority, including of the Israelis and certainly the Americans, and their ability to conventionally attack Iran's homeland. So it is developing all of these capabilities as a deterrent to prevent this kind of attack. So I think they, they do take it seriously. Um, but I think they do feel they have enough or sufficient deterrent um, signaling uh, to possibly prevent it. But I, I also think it's important to note that it's not like everyone's sitting on their hands waiting for this big military strike. And we've been through these military strike debates many, many times. Um, this is like a back to the future discussion. And the reason it has not been undertaken is because of all of this political, uh, of this strategic, political, military fallout, but also because of the very basic fact that it is not clear you can eradicate Iran's drive to nuclear capability should it decide to move in that direction for weapons uh, through a military strike. It has the technical know-how. You certainly can set it back. Uh, but I think, and Avner can speak to this, historically, it is very difficult to bomb a program out of existence yes, once so you've we, gotten that kind of scientific know-how. So we have really one minute left, and, and Avner, I want to give you the last question exactly continuing on what Dalia said. Is there historical precedence that can give us some optimism on the hand, ending of this story, or not at all? Well, um, there is no. I mean, I mean, I mean, we're not going to have the case of South Africa. Short of change of regime in Iran, I think that Iran would continue with its desire to be closer and closer to the bomb. There is one element that we don't know, and it's an element of uncertainty, and it's the issue of cyber. What cyber can do uh, in a non-kinetic -kinetic way 
uh, in terms of uh, not just as, a, as the beginning, as the first uh, blow for, for military actions, but in itself. Uh, Stuxnet was, was uh, you know, 12 years ago, more than that, and it was partially successful, not completely, and definitely bought some time. But the area of cyber is still mysterious to, to many because we don't know what nations have in their arsenal, what they are planning, and it's quite possible that that could be a kind of surprise uh, for the future. But we'll have, uh, to, wait. Uh, yes. we'll, we'll, yes. we'll have to wait and see. Friends, we're out of time. I want to thank you, Avner Cohen, Dalia Dasake, Sima Shine, and Amos Oil for a fascinating discussion. I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure many of our viewers as well. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello to former Foreign Minister and Justice Minister of Israel, Tsipi Livni. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hello, ma'am. Great to have you. Great to have you with us. And you're joining us after an interesting visit to the Gulf that you just completed. What were you doing over there? Well, it's a conference that uh, naturally I cannot share the discussions there, but um, for me it was uh, very touching because I've met uh, those that for many years I've met discreetly uh, until the normalization uh, with Israel. And for the first time it's uh, open, public, uh, no need to hide the, the relationship, uh, so it was quite moving. You also visited some countries in that region when you were foreign minister at the time, correct? I was once at uh, Doha, Qatar, and it was quite, uh, um, I don't know, quite uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting visit for an Israeli foreign minister that was welcomed uh, uh, in Doha, in Qatar, uh, but uh, many years have passed since that time. And a lot has changed geopolitically. When you look back at the relations that were beginning to materialize between Israel and some of these countries when you were foreign minister and later when you were chief negotiator with the Palestinians in a different government, are you surprised that we reached the current point of normalization and open relationships? Well, I was surprised when I heard about Abraham Accords. I was quite happy. Uh, because for many years we tried to uh, promote this kind of normalization, but always the answer was uh, the Arab Peace Initiative. First reach an agreement with the Palestinians and then we uh, will uh, normalize our relations with Israel. And for the first time a brave, uh, courageous decision was made to make normalization uh, with Israel regardless. Uh, so. Um, even uh, just a few months before that, I was invited, not in, in a formal position, but I was invited uh, to Abu Dhabi, uh, but I couldn't say that I'm there. And a few months later, it was uh, signed as a peace treaty normalization that it is clear now that it's going to be a warm peace, uh, in a way unlike what we are having with uh, Egypt and uh, Jordan, unfortunately. Yeah, I, mean, I heard that we've had until now about a quarter of a million Israelis who had already visited uh, Dubai since the agreement with the UAE was signed, so that definitely supports what you just said. I want to ask you uh, broadly, what do you feel was a stronger motivating factor behind these countries' decision to get closer to Israel? Was it more about the positive benefits that can arise from peace or more about the negative threat of a common enemy, Iran and its proxies in the region? I think it's both. Uh, for many years it was clear that uh, we can be and should be allies facing the threat of uh, Iran that is threatening not only Israel, but also Gulf states and the entire world. So it was clear that we should and need cooperate, and this is a mutual interest of Israel and Gulf states. Uh, but frankly, this kind of cooperation or part of this co cooperation happened even before uh, the public normalization. Therefore, I believe there was another element, and this was uh, also the understanding that cooperation and good relations helps also not only the economy, but uh, other aspects of life. What I heard, for example, in the last few days is that during COVID, it was all, also clear that cooperation in terms of health 
and science is needed uh, in our region. So it was another um, uh, another thing that affected affected it. So I believe that it's altogether a combination of everything. Do you see potential for these agreements with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, to also have some impact on the Israeli-Palestinian arena? If in the past, like you said, uh, there was a demand of first make an agreement with the Palestinians and then you can get closer to the Arab world, can it also work the other way around that these agreements will open the door to progress on the Palestinian track? Well, I'll speak openly about the upside and the downside. Uh, the upside is that, of course, we are having normalization as an Israeli, I'm quite happy about it. Uh, and maybe also uh, it's a message for the Palestinian side, listen, you can continue forever by saying no or not giving an answer to quite just uh, agreements and drafts that were put on the table. This is the upside, but on the downside, of course, um, for Israelis, fruits of peace were um, hypothetically the relations with Gulf states because in future agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, the average Israeli would think that we are giving, we are giving land, taking calculated risk, but the risks uh, of terror. So uh, the main reason to do so maybe for some was having normalization with the Arab world. Now, uh, as you could see, uh, Netanyahu uh, sold it as we can have peace for peace, which is completely nonsense when it comes to the relations between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, so the motivation, uh, maybe it uh, affected also the motivation of achieving peace with the Palestinians, knowing that anyway, uh, we can have normalization without the need to achieve peace with the Palestinians. I, of course, believe that peace with the Palestinians is a pure Israeli interest and not a favor to Gulf states or the United States. And you say it's uh, first but, of all for but, us. But, but, the truth, but the truth, yes, of course, uh, it's our interest because otherwise uh, Israel would turn into a mixed uh, state with an ongoing conflict inside. But it is clear that uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not on the agenda since the normalization. We passed Israel, passed four rounds of elections, and this was not on the agenda, and we have a government deciding not to touch uh, sensitive issues, and this is the most sensitive issue. Uh, so I am, when it comes to uh, the need to achieve peace with the Palestinians, I am worried these days. So I do want to ask you about that, because in your last uh, years uh, in the political arena, you were very strongly affiliated with pushing for a two-state solution. Uh, in the uh, government that you were a member of at the time with uh, Netanyahu and Yair Lapid, you were uh, uh, holding the uh, file of negotiations with the Palestinians. Today, 2021, do you believe the two-state solution is still viable, still possible to reach it? Without exaggerating, the reason for me to be in politics was the need to achieve this. And since we are having a national conflict, uh, I believed that the solution that was already on the table since 1947, uh, a Jewish state and an Arab state, or a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, uh, gives an answer to national aspiration of different peoples, Israel for the Jewish people and the Palestinian state for the Palestinian, just solution that uh, a win-win situation. Uh, it's not a secret that when uh, time passes by, it can more and more problematic to achieve, more and more difficult. In 2014, I was the chief negotiator for peace. Uh, by the way, I'm the chief negotiator for peace in the last two rounds of negotiations with the Palestinians. And uh, we worked with the Americans on, um, on a framework for negotiations that uh, was offered in, on March 17, 2014. Uh, to Abu Mazen in his meeting with Obama in the White House, and he didn't give an answer, unfortunately. Again, he didn't give an answer. The, 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 this history that, that you're recounting now is exactly why some people, and we're going to hear from people who hold those views later today, say that the two-state solution, maybe it was the perfect idea, but uh, now it's uh, water under the bridge. What's your answer to those people? 
Uh, firstly, I hear the voices of there is no partner on the other side, and I can criticize the other side as well, but blame game doesn't help. And secondly, it is our interest. At first, we as, as Israelis need to decide what is our interest. And I believe that our national GPS is Jewish democratic state, secure Jewish democratic state. And in order to keep uh, Israel as such, we need to uh, divide the land and to separate ourselves from the Palestinians uh, in an agreement. So if there is another solution that gives me the same answer, my vision is not about the Palestinian state, but it's about the need to keep Israel as a Jewish democratic state in hopefully in an agreement with, uh, with the other side. So if somebody would put on the table another, uh, another idea that gives an answer to our national aspiration as well uh, to the national aspiration of the Palestinian fight, fine with me. But I, I cannot see another solution right now for this. So I'm not against thinking outside of the box, but as long there is no, there is no other solution, I don't want to take the solution that, that we are working for many years uh, uh, to promote, to take it off the table. And I must say that my feeling these days is that in a way we are all in a car uh, that quite of my, uh, some of my friends from uh, center left are quite happy that the driver is not Netanyahu, uh, which is fine with me as well. Uh, but yet where this car is, is, is heading. And my feeling is that uh, the car is moving slowly but surely to a one state. One state not as a solution, but as a reality. And this is something uh, that we cannot afford and will affect the existence and the nature of Israel as a Jewish democratic state. In general, do you see any potential for us to be surprised by this current government with the very eclectic, diverse makeup uh, of ideologies on the Palestinian issue? Let's say, okay, Bennett said we will not evacuate settlements, there will not be a Palestinian state. What can be done to move forward under such circumstances? I think that the most important thing is, and this I believe should be the role of the US to uh, put again as uh, a destination uh, for all of us, the two states uh, as the compass that was there before and for a while was thinking for annexation and other uh, ideas. And then to say clearly uh, that uh, the support will be on uh, actions that uh, support this idea and that um, uh, against uh, action and policies that would make uh, this uh, vision more difficult to uh, be implemented in the future. I think that there is one thing which is a huge common denominator and this is economic or um, improving uh, the economic situation on the Palestinian side, not as a replacement, not as economic peace instead of uh, political peace and not as a condition to something that they need to do. It's a pure Israeli interest. I believe that this government uh, understands it. And uh, therefore, uh, this is something that everybody can agree upon. And uh, I hope that also this government understands that empowering the moderates on the Palestinian side, including Fatah and the PA, the Palestinian Authority, is a pure Israeli interest. And therefore, I hope that this is at least something that uh, will be done under the, the understanding that we need to keep the door open. We need to keep the road, the road open if hopefully in the future we can reach a situation of negotiating and reaching uh, an agreement. Tsipi Livni, the former Foreign Minister and Justice Minister of Israel, thank you very much for joining us today for this discussion. Thank you. Hello everybody and following the interview with former minister Tsipi Livni, we want to continue the discussion about uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. And with this uh, panel, we're going to try and 
solve in a less than a quick hour um, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Piece of cake, right? We can do this. Um, so with me here are uh, Amir Fakhouri, who is the director of the research center at Neve Shalom Wachat al Salam, advisor to joint society projects in Israel. And uh, Gilad Sher, who is a former senior Israeli peace negotiator and chief of staff to uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, and currently uh, a fellow at the Rice University's Baker uh, Institute for Public Policy. Uh, and we also have, of course, Micha Goodman, who is a writer and researcher of Jewish thought, author of the best-selling book on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, Catch 67. So uh, we're going to uh, start uh, with you, Amir. Uh, if you could maybe, um, you know, as much as you can uh, in approximately uh, 10 minutes, explain to us uh, your original uh, solution to the conflict. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here with my uh, revered uh, colleagues and uh, panelists here. <laughs> Uh, it's not my solution. I'm here on behalf of uh, uh, the political initiative to states one homeland, which uh, uh, basically advocate uh, confederation, both as, both as a political structure and a political sentiment. Uh, and I will uh, 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 further elaborate on that. So basically, we advocate uh, two states with an open, board, uh, open borders, and it's uh, 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 it is good to. to uh, remind uh, uh, all of us that the original partition plan uh, was uh, imagined as a confederation, as uh, Jerusalem as a joined uh, shared city, as uh, Palestine, the state of Palestine, the state of Israel, as uh, a, a one a, a, a monetary a, 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 a unit. So we advocated two independent states with an open, open borders, two sovereign states, two nation states. Uh, and they, uh, that coming together in a shared institution to, uh, to manage uh, which is inherently shared uh, interest and shared uh, 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 national resources, material resources like, uh, uh, like aquifers uh, and such. Uh, and uh, uh, we think that uh, this uh, structure, uh, I guess, which reminds us of the, in, in, in some way, the EU, uh, can help us to find a way out of the deadlock, uh, especially which is uh, uh, confined in the ref refugees issues and the settlements. We see uh, the settlements as a political structure that should be uh, treated politically, and uh, uh, any, any Israeli settlers which are willing to succumb to the to the sovereignty of the young Palestinian state should uh, should be there, of course, uh, 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 in uh, 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 in a framework of decolonization of the uh, settlements uh, that become uh, and the, the Israelis which there will become uh, uh, residents of the Palestinian state and uh, 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 nationals of the Israeli state, and vice versa we, we, in what concerns Palestinians, uh, Palestinians refugees, and uh, by no means I'm doing here a, cem a cemetery, uh, uh, which want to uh, 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 exercise the right of return, they will become, if they uh, uh, choose to, residents of, of Israel and nationals of the Palestinian state. So it, 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 we think that structurally saying, politically and structurally uh, uh, wise, we think that this uh, uh, holistic uh, uh, look to the state as, as to the homeland, to this ge geopolitical unit, Israel, Palestine, can give us more a uh, spectrum of maneuver to give uh, uh, creative ideas. And, and I want to emphasize that, it is based upon not only rational, political, uh, 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 structural ideas, but upon a narrative which, uh, which says we have here two nations living in a close vicinity that should understand and should be educated that they cannot uh, 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 entertain the idea that uh, they will live here without, saying the other, uh, the, without seeing the other nation. We should 
educate the young Palestinian boy and the young uh, Jew, Israeli Jewish girl that they are here together in a shared homeland, whether they like it or not. And stemming from this uh, uh, existential uh, understanding, uh, we can build the uh, built and maintain political structure and not otherwise. So this this is what the two uh, uh, nations should be taught that they live here with another sh uh, nation and they should it, it try to uh, develop their political imagination how to share and not how to separate. There is Palestinians already. Fifth of the uh, uh, fifth of the population of Israel is Palestinians. Is, is Arab Palestinians. So and I'm not going. Uh, to uh, 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 go into the dangers of 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 cultivating this uh, 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 this political imagination of separation, the, all of uh, the modern world uh, 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 went to power sharing power sharing models to to find a way out of intractable conflict. We Palestinians and Israeli uh, uh, Jews can find a way which seems from the sharing narrative, not the separation. And I will finish with this point. Uh, all of what I said already is, is uh, all of what I said is already anchored in the political reality nowadays in Palestine and Israel, even under uh, uh, terms of Jewish superiority. We have cooperation in terms of security, in terms of aquifers, in terms of, of open, uh, we have 200 a thousand Palestinians from the West Bank uh, coming into Israel in a daily basis. So what we are at, what we are asking it is a natural thing. It's already anchored and it not it need to perfect it. It need to be democ democratized. Thank you, Amir. So uh, Gilad, uh, a confederation, uh, settlers uh, staying in Palestine, uh, joint institutions for a two-stater that must all sound like a fantasy, right? It sounds good. I mean, I'm not, I'm not ruling <laughs> out fantasy. anything that, anything that uh, Amir mentioned here, uh, but uh, I believe that first we have to, uh, we have to deal with the, um, with the core issues that, uh, that are the contentious issues between Israel and the Palestinians. Then maybe later, once we have a, uh, a partition of the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea into two nation states, uh, then we can proceed towards um, any kind of structure that, that uh, looks like um, confederation or other structures that were mentioned in, uh, in the uh, public debate about that. Um, I believe that, you know, uh, looking at the objectives of, uh, of uh, the national security of Israel and, and the, the long-term objectives of Israel, I believe that uh, the only way to secure uh, Israel as the democratic nation state of the Jewish people is by separating itself from uh, um, of the Palestinians and uh, and for the Palestinians to have their statehood um, with self determination in in a state of their own is the only way to have a border between between the two uh, the two nation states. Now we are 14 million people, Israelis and Palestinians. That's all between uh, in, in the, on, on this piece of land, and we have to first divorce, then we might engage in a, in a different path. I believe that, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, when, I, when I was at the Institute for National Security Studies, uh, we used to, um, to um, uh, once a year, uh, look at all the, um, all the, the, the structures and the, um, all the initiatives and all the plans that were on the table at that point in time, analyze them according to, uh, to a certain set of uh, parameters, and and year after year after year, the two-state solution got the, 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 by far the, the, the best, uh, the best uh, rating in, the, uh, in, in, in this research. Now, why is that? Um, look, the, there's the status both, quo... Both uh, Israelis and Palestinians, by the way? Yes. Those surveys? Yes, but of course, I mean, I'm, I'm talking as, as an Israeli Jew. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at my uh, at, at the uh, 
Declaration of Independence of 1948 as my, um, more or less my Bill of Rights, my Constitution, my, uh, that, that's what I'm looking for. You know, the kind of universal values with the, uh, um, uh, Israel being the, the uh, nation state of the Jewish people and all together combined in a, uh, in a set of semi-constitutional um, set of values. So I, I look at the status quo and the status quo or even at, at management of the conflict, which, which is often mentioned as, uh, as the way to, uh, to proceed. Uh, you know, we don't have to take any, any decision. You, know, you don't have to uh, demonstrate any kind of leadership. You just manage the conflict. But the truth of the matter is that there's no such thing as managing a conflict. The conflicts usually manages the, the conflict manages the, uh, the, the parties that are, um, that are in managers. dispute. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 uh, we see it throughout history. Um, and even, even uh, during these, uh, these very days. So this will probably not be, you know, the, the two-state solution is probably only a vehicle to lead towards a better future for Israelis and Palestinians, but uh, and it doesn't have to be a, a one-off, um, standalone, you know, permanent status agreement according to certain parameters, be it the, the Clinton parameters or uh, or uh, the Annapolis ones. Um, you know, very very few rounds of real negotiations on permanent status that we had uh, in the last three decades. Perhaps 10% of the time we were negotiating a permanent status. But along the parameters, more or less, I would suggest addressing this as a, 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 um, an attempt to, um, to change the trend that is currently leading towards a disastrous one-state solution by national state. This is disastrous for Israelis and for Palestinians alike. So reverse the trend towards a gradual advancement towards a two-state reality and preserving the conditions that would allow a two-state solution to, to, to come up at a certain point in time without negating uh, the, uh, the, 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 the final agreement that, that might, might be attained. So first, uh, it should be a, a gradual process. Second, it should be a three-pronged approach uh, process. Regional, you know, we can capitalize on whatever happens in the region and with our uh, allies and, 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 and the, the, the two countries that, that have long ago signed agreements in, in, of peace with us, Egypt and Jordan. Um, in other developments of the uh, of, of the last year or two uh, with the Abraham Accords, etc. So, capitalize on that. Then bilateral negotiations. We need to discuss uh, whatever happens, and we need an international. We need an international. Um, I wouldn't say supervisor, but at least a uh, a, um, a kindergarten uh, <laughs> uh, kind of of. Um, of of body, perhaps the Active quartet, convener. perhaps others, you know, that, that would, would lock us in a room and, and allow us to uh, discuss whatever divergences we have, and we do have a lot of divergences, including within our internal domestic um, um, constituencies, each one of us. Um, but at least whatever is agreed or mutually coordinated would be implemented. And then, little by little, you build layer over layer of, uh, you pave the way towards a, uh, an ultimate possible two-state solution. Then you can do whatever you want. You can confederate, you can whatever, okay? Uh, so I, I believe that this is, is, is <coughs> it's, it's always not the time for this kind of, of major decisions. But if you do it gradually, then these are not so major decisions that you have to, uh, that have, have to be taken. So um, 
I'm also looking for uh, for ways to uh, to um, change the mindsets of, of uh, the people of this region towards making peace. You know, we plan a lot of um, clashes, wars, um, um, all kind of violent, uh, different degrees of violence uh, and violent conflict between us. And so we plan it and uh, there's military planning. There's, uh, mm -hmm. let's plan peace. Let's plan peace once and for all. Thank you, Gilad. And uh, Micha, working on your book, uh, I, uh, you must have you know, spoken to many people you know, hearing um, these approaches uh, to state solution and the you know, new US Confederation idea, but you came to a different conclusion. That's right, that's right. My conclusion is called shrinking the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, maybe dramatically shrinking the conflict, but assuming conflict is here to stay. And to understand this paradigm of shrinking the conflict, I think there's two main things we have to understand. One, what's a paradigm shift? And two, how do we tap into the invisible Israeli consensus? I'll move from the first to the second, okay? So what's the paradigm shift? I really enjoy listening to Amir and to Gilad, and they presented what Gilad called like the, like what's the ultimate end game? Like how does it end? What's the solution to the conflict? So there's a basic assumption here that the holy grail is end to conflict. Gilad also mentioned the alternative. The alternative is managing the conflict. Now, if ending the conflict is a transformation of the status quo, um, managing the conflict is freezing the status quo. Now, here's my question. Are those the two options we have? Is that true? Now, I just want to notice that we don't think that way about any problem we deal with in life. Take COVID, for example. Yes, I think New Zealand and Australia had this fantasy of no COVID, zero COVID, to put an end to COVID. And I think they failed. I think they failed. Most countries said, we can't put an end to COVID. But when they realized that we can't put an end to COVID, did they start ignoring COVID, neglecting COVID? Most countries are trying to figure out a strategy to shrink COVID. When it comes to car accidents, no one is saying let's put an end to car accident. And the alternative to putting an end to car accidents is not ignoring car accidents. Crime, no one says let's put an end to crime. And no one says, let's ignore crime. When it comes to real problems, we don't try to end them. We don't ignore them. We try to shrink them. That's what we think about most problems. And then there's a conflict. And either a messianic or indifferent. End it or ignore it. Manage it. Freeze it. Let's think about the conflict like we think about COVID, car accidents, and crime. Let's stop ending it. Let's stop managing it. Those are not the only options. It's a false dichotomy, the illusion there's only two options. If we think about this problem like we think about any problem in the world, well, come to a conclusion that we have to shrink it. But what does it mean to shrink it? What does it mean to shrink the size of the conflict? To explain this and why I think shrinking the conflict is possible, because I think it's an approach that taps in to what most people don't know that most Israelis agree. Not all, agree, not all Israelis agree. But there is an invisible, Israel is so polarized and divided and angry at each other that it's, that polarization is hiding, it's masking an invisible Israeli agreement. And it's a paradoxical agreement. Here's how it goes. Most Israelis do not want to control the lives of Palestinians. The fact that in the West Bank, there is a military regime controlling a civilian population in different levels is something that not all Israelis, but most Israelis don't like that. They feel like it's unethical, not Jewish, not Zionistic, and it's a threat, it's a, it's a threat to the future of Israel as a Jewish state, Jewish democracy, like Gilad said. At the same time, and probably with more passion and more emphasis, most Israelis are afraid. They're afraid that a withdrawal would put Israel under serious threat. So here's what most Israelis agree on. They don't want to control the Palestinians. They're afraid of any move that would put them under the th under threat of Palestinians. It's a problem. I would say a great visualization of this paradoxical agreement of most Israelis is horrible May. I think we could all agree this last May was a very low moment in the history of Israel. And we saw two things in May. One, rockets on Tel Aviv. Two, Lod, civil war in Lod. So, some people- And Akko and Jaffa. And Akko and Jaffa and, and, and um, Ramle. To remind us that's the- right. I know, that's true. I'm saying they'll just have a powerful image, but yeah, it was all over the place. And then, when we saw Lod, so many Israelis say, wow, if we stay in the, if a binational city doesn't work, Will a binational state work? People looking at Lod and say, saw, if Israel stays in the West Bank, 
Eventually, Israel turns into Lod. Israel is a binational state. We don't want that. At the same time, Israel is looking at Tel Aviv. And they're saying, well, Tel Aviv, for one week, has the feel and taste of what it means to be a resident of Sderot, very close to Gaza, all year. So <coughs> Israelis were saying, if we leave the West Bank, Tel Aviv will be Sderot. If we stay in the West Bank, Israel, Israel will be Lod. These are two catastrophes that most Israelis want to avoid. Again, Israelis don't want to control the lives of Palestinians, and yet they're afraid of withdrawal that will put them under the threat of a failed state in the West Bank. And there is good reasons to, to believe that a Palestinian state will be a failed state. Look at Gaza, look at other presidents. So how do you tap in, how do you turn this paradoxical, invisible Israeli consensus? How do you do that? Well, there's no real alchemy here, but here's shrinking the conflict is the following. These are steps on the ground, on the ground, maybe unilateral, maybe based on local agreements that dramatically shrink the amount that Israelis control the lives of Palestinians without decrease, decreasing the amount of security that Israelis enjoy. To control the Palestinians a lot less without being threatened from them more. What does it look like? Am I out of time? No, no, it's okay. Okay, what, is what does it really look like? These are steps right now, um, the lived reality in the West Bank is like this. There's over 160 autonomous, Palestinian autonomous islands that are not connected to each other. Every island is an autonomy, but they're not connected to each other because in between this Area C, Area C is area controlled by the IDF, by the Israeli Defense Forces. You 60%. What? 60% of 60% the land. 60% of the land, that's right. Yep. So that means that the amount of self-governance of the Palestinian Authority is extremely low. Mm -hmm. There's another problem, by the way, that there's over 160 autonomous islands are not connected. They have no way to go abroad in a sovereign way. They're in an airport or, 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 or a port in the ocean, in the, in the sea. A second problem is that they can't really do their own planning and zoning. There's just not enough land around their villages and towns. A third problem is, is because of the Paris Protocol, I won't go into a lot of details, but the Palestinian economy is not an independent economy. It's very much dependent on Israel. Let's take care of all this. Israel is occupying. <laughs> yes. So, so here's a question. I think Israel, without an ultimate solution, could solve all three problems, which means roughly connecting Palestinian autonomous islands to each other, mm -hmm. connecting them to the world, expanding towns and cities so they could have planning and zoning, and liberating their economy. Okay, now, so without, let without, me tell you so something. Let me just, let me just, let me just end, end here's one minute. Let me just conclude. Uh, on this point, okay. After the Palestinians are connected to each other, connected to the world, and independent economically, the conflict doesn't end. It doesn't end. Okay. All that happens is the following. They have more self-governance, and Israel doesn't have less security. That is shrinking the conflict, and here's the thing. Let's do that tomorrow morning. Let's not wait for the conditions for peace. Let's do that tomorrow morning. <clears throat> okay, so I'm, that's on shrinking the conflicts. Uh, Gilad, conflict. before I, I the, wanted to, the conflict. Uh, you know, the, 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 two, the two core issues that were never a, uh, a major problem are territory and security. Those are the ones that, that, that Micha tackles, okay? So uh, in the negotiations on permanent status, okay, territory, Borders, settlements, security, security arrangements, demilitarization of Palestine, etc., were never the, at, at the, uh, the, the sticking points of the negotiations. Um, and I believe that when you have a picture, uh, you know, uh, that demonstrates the, uh, the end game, does not negate what you suggest. Because you, can, you, you were talking about the gradual process, you and you're talking about the gradual process without, that. without ca calling the end. But, but you the, have to resolve the conflict, and can eventually I, you will. You so have just to a second, I, I, want, I, I, want, I want for a second um, ask Amir, uh, because I saw you were uh, moving inconveniently in your chair uh, during uh, Zmicha's presentation. You interpret, interpret me correctly. <laughs> And uh, I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, my, fi my feeling was that I, I think uh, both gentlemen um, were talking uh, very much from an Israeli point of view, and they said so, uh, which, you know, the, the conflict, of course, has another side. And the other thing is, I think, in, in Micha's presentation, uh, we heard a lot about um, 
steps that are necessary uh, from your point of view on the ground, but not a lot about what you mentioned, which is nationality and the narrative and you know the psychology of the conflict, which uh, does involve right. an end game. That's right. First of all, narratives are not only psychological; they're they're anchored in the uh, uh, national sentiments of both sides. But but you, again, you were correct. I was. Uh, uh, moving inconveniently because I'm afraid that uh, uh, the, uh, the eloquent uh, uh, presentation of my friend here is, uh, is based upon very problematic premises and, and I will explain. First and foremost, my friend here, uh, uh, and I'm afraid so, is, uh, is utterly uh, uh, neglecting the international law. Does international law uh, uh, allow Israel as an occupying force to shrink occupation? There is no shrinking occupation. It's a matter of uh, human rights. And the second premise, uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, if my, uh, this uh, uh, eloquent uh, equation include Palestinian will. Does, did, you, did you ever ask Palestinian representatives, do you agree to shrinking occupation? I'm guessing he will tell you, do not shrink occupation, just get out of my land, according to international law, the same international law that you derive legitimacy to your state. So you can't, you can't uh, 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 conduct a, 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 a conversation about uh, the Palestinians' uh, situation while regarding Palestinians. And to, to this extent, you can't conduct a conversation on this uh, conflict uh, from only uh, 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 internal uh, Israeli perspective, and this is this is what lies what what enables that. This is the power stances. What enables such uh, uh, interpretation? And I'm fully sure that it comes from good intentions. That uh, Micha and my uh, uh, Israeli. Uh, 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 Jewish-Israeli uh, co-citizens uh, feel enough indulged with power to entertain a conversation about Palestinians' destiny without Palestinians in, in this political imagination. Palestinians, in the, in the, most major, the vast majority of them, do not want you to uh, uh, shrink. They want, as any, any nation, they want sovereignty. Okay, it will be in a progressive incremental way. I, 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 um, I think it, it is, it is, uh, uh, it is a legitimate uh, uh, way, methodological way of thinking. But first and foremost, any any solution should be anchored not only in a political, uh, uh, in, in a real, real polit politique way. It should be anchored in international law. And your equation lacks international any said any reference to international law. And it should be anchored only in, in the, uh, it should be addressed the grievousness of the uh, occupied people. Okay, Micha, you'll get an opportunity definitely to answer that. But first, Gilad, because I think you'll probably also. Yeah, I, um, I'd like to make three very brief points. The first one is that uh, uh, this, this kind of, of shrinking the conflict and, and managing it, um, of, of this approach, this kind of approach, um, I, I, I'm concerned that some of the trends that are currently um, um, worrying us um, would be irreversible by, by not moving towards something that is more than just managing or shrinking or uh, handling the conflict. But, okay? but again, what, because one. you're talking about the gradual process. He's yes. talking about the gradual process. Right. So the difference is that, is that you point at the end game, which is two yes. states. And you think that that yes. is important Definitely. in the gradual process. Why is that? Because I would people like need to a see vision of the end? I need the vision of the end of two nation states with a border borderline between them uh, with a, um, uh, a sufficient, um, I would say, uh, resolution of uh, and satisfactory resolution of the core contentious issues, Jerusalem, the holy sites, the old city, refugees, 
um, uh, the, the, the settlements, borders, uh, territory, and security arrangements. All these should be, should be resolved at a certain point in time. You cannot, and, and because at a certain point in, in, in time, if we do not move towards that objective, then some of the trends might be reversible. The second point is, is uh, the, the, uh, the uh, paradox uh, about, about security, that, uh, that the, the fear is, or the, 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 um, the concern is that once there is a Palestinian state, uh, then Israel would be would be threatened by uh, by it, and I, you know, uh, I happen to be uh, the 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 uh, the, uh, the chair uh, chairman of the executive board of Sapir Academic College, situated two miles from the border of Gaza, and I'm telling you that along uh, uh, that across the uh, the the Gaza envelope uh, um, um, uh, villages, towns, and, and cities, there is a vast majority for an agreement with the Palestinians, not for continuing the status quo, not for continuing uh, to, to manage the conflict. Number three, independent steps are needed. Independent steps that are in line with a, an eventual two-state solution mm -hmm. that contribute to either the negotiations or to the situation on the ground, such as, for instance, differentiating between uh, those settlements that will be part and parcel of Israel once the borderline is, is the, the boundaries are, uh, are delineated. Uh, that's about 75 to 80 percent of the settlers that are living adjacent. Okay, so that's an interesting point because you're saying uh, without the uh, end goal, uh, then which gradual steps are we actually taking? So, uh, Micha, there, there are two claims here. So the first, Amil is saying you're not even taking into consideration the Palestinian will in, in, in this uh, you know, story. And Gilad also says, you know, it's very important what is your end goal because that, you know, in the end describes also the steps that you're taking towards it. Okay. Is that our time? You have six minutes? Yes. Okay. And I probably have less time in <laughs> that, right? And of course, will, the reference yeah, so to, to, so I'll to try, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to respond very, yes, very briefly, very quickly. And obviously, I won't be able to respond to everything you said. Of um, yes, of course. Any solution needs to be anchored in, in international law. What I'm offering is not a solution. It's not a solution. But it's a way to break the status quo, to break the frozen reality, and to move forward and to reduce suffering. I want to notice something. Over 20 years, the situation in the West Bank has been frozen. By the way, the fact that politically it's frozen doesn't mean that the trends on the ground are frozen. A lot of suffering it's frozen is frozen for Palestinians. That's suffer right. Suffer every exactly. day. The exactly. Expropriation. Exactly. Suffer. It's not frozen. Exactly. For them. Exactly. Only politically, it's frozen. Now, here's the big question: Why has it been frozen? Why was there no initiative for more than 20 years? Well, here's why: If any step is measured by the question, will this end the conflict? Well, if it doesn't end the conflict, we're not doing it. If it doesn't lead to complete, complete independence, to complete resolution of the conflict, so the step is off the table. So here, there is a, there is a, a concern that I agree with, that the settlement movement, is, its ideology is freezing the status quo. I think also the peace ideology is freezing the status quo also. I'll try to explain why. Because if any step on the ground, like connecting autonomous islands to each other, connecting them to the world, changing reality on the ground, if any step depends on a peace agreement, I'm afraid that peace agreement that's not coming means no steps on the ground. So if any step depends on peace. No, it's the other way around. It's peace, so. let, 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 me, let me just finish here. Yes, peace that's not coming means no steps on the ground. So the myth of peace is freezing the status quo just like the myth of settlements. So shrinking the, now, now towards, end, now towards your question about end game, um, is it true that a withdrawal from the West Bank risks Israeli security? Does it risk Israeli security? It's an academic and it's an important question. I just want to notice most Israelis think that it does risk Israeli security, and that is why end game rhetoric doesn't tap in to the broad Israeli consensus. And without the broad Israeli consensus, it's very hard to make progress and to move forward. Here's the thing I want to speak one last thing about end game, okay? Once Israel takes initiative, with Palestinians, with local agreements, with Palestinians. And by the way, the Palestinians have to make a decision, yes? Um, Israel was formed by the sum of small steps. David Ben-Gurion started building Israel from the bottom up. 
Okay, increasing, we definitely do not have time for the history okay, of Israel. Okay, increasing self-governance <laughs> until it was a state. Yes, um, I'm not saying Palestinians need to, need to support Zionism, not at all. I'm saying Palestinians need to be like Zionism. It's a very successful movement, being like Zionism, building their, building their sovereignty bottom up, shrinking the conflict enables exactly that. And finally, once Israel connects the autonomous islands to each other, connects them to the world, liberates their economy, we can speak about a real autonomy here, not a state, but it's what Israeli general called Giyoha Aydin calls critical mass of self-governance. Once you have that, well, it fits into many end games. One end game, two state. Second end game, confederation. Third end game, confederation with Jordan. Fourth end game, they get an autonomy. It, makes, it, it, fit, it fits into multiple end games. Right now, we thought we have to agree on the end game to play, to play the game. I'm saying let's not agree on the end game, only agree on the game, and then we can move forward. Maybe you should have called it um, unfreeze the status quo instead of shrinking the conflict, which is causing maybe the conflict. No, well, never. But, uh, okay, ending remarks, uh, Gilad and Amir. So I, I, I say that uh, there's no, uh, not much difference between, uh, between what, uh, what we all uh, speak about. Um, and, uh, and the question is, how do you go about that? How do you, how do you start moving? towards any direction when you're not negotiating, you're not, there's no process of, of any, any kind of dialogue um, between Israelis and Palestinians for, for quite a long time, since um, um, 2014, I think, last time that, that, that there were any kind of talks. Well, we had a couple of but meetings would, recently. Yes, which are not you know, but these are, these are photo op meetings. These are, not, these are not negotiations. You negotiate every day, you know, day in, day out. Uh, the, um, I, I, my, my, final, my, my final suggestion is this. Uh, when I negotiated, Kim David, Intaba, et cetera, and the, the, um, all the, the covert negotiations, we, all, we always had this paradigm or this formula of nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, which, of course, blocks the, uh, uh, blocks the way towards uh, a, a full-fledged agreement. Um, I believe that we need to change that. And here I agree with Micha. Whatever is agreed or mutually coordinated or independently suggesting a, a, a preservation of a two-state solution should be implemented. That changes the, uh, the, the mindsets of the people. It, sh it, it, it is visible on the ground. And it leads towards a better reality. We need to move from reality A uh, of the conflict to reality B of moving towards ending the conflict, even if we do not end it immediately and we, there's no feasibility for that right now. So that's, that's, that's my uh, proposal to uh, kind of link uh, the three of us into, into one way that we could, uh, we could um, uh, move forward. Oh, so uh, we're not going to end the conflict. That's already, I think, pretty sure. But Mirka we're gonna, doesn't want to but, end the but, conflict. <laughs> right, we, we're not going to shrink or end it. But, but we are going to end the panel. So I mean, uh, as a final words. remark, uh, you, you know what? Uh, theoretically speaking, there is no wrong in thinking about ending conflicts or even managing conflict in, in an incremental way, gradual way. But again, we. There is, no, there is no need for theory over here. We're here after 100 years of conflict. And we, we saw when we say gradual or, or let us, let us uh, if not, or not agree on that, let us uh, 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 proceed. Proceeding is, is deepening the occupation, deepening the Palestinian suffer. What has not been agreed upon has become even uh, more aggravated. So, so what, what this theory of, of, of graduality should be, uh, of course, uh, 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 anchored in, in, in a certain uh, his, uh, history. And the second, thing, uh, th uh, second, second and last remark, which is impeding uh, the ending of uh, uh, the apartheid regime and occupation in the West Bank are not peace initiatives and not the, the thinking that uh, uh, the Israeli occu military occupation should end Tomorrow, this is not impeding peace. Regardless what is, of an agreement, regardless yes. of a, it, it should end according again to, to international law, and it's, this should be emphasized again and again. What is impeding peace is 
the uh, uh, Jewish Israeli super, superiority ideology that most of the Israelis, the vast of, uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of the Israelis indulge, and they indulge a sentiment of superiority because they can, because the power relation enables them. So if you want peace to become, if they want to end Palestinian suffering, we should think how to legitimize the rising of Palestinian power, and we should think in power relation terms, not only in, in uh, 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 this, uh, this is another critical paradigm shift that should be uh, embraced. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, you all uh, for coming here, of course, but also for you know keeping this discussion alive. It's not so trivial uh, these days, so it thank is. you very much um, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. And we're back and we're saying hello to Transportation Minister, member of the Israeli Security Cabinet and Chairwoman of the Labour Party, Merav Michaeli. Hello, Amir. Great to have you with us in the Haaretz UCLA conference. Thank you for having me. And let's get right to the difficult issues. Talks with Iran are renewing these days, the United States talking to Tehran. We saw in the past a previous Israeli Prime Minister take a very confrontational approach when the Obama administration was negotiating with Tehran. What should we expect from the government that you are now a member of? Israel needs to be concerned about the nuclear bottom line. That is what we should care about and what we should work about and for. And what we need to do is work very, very closely with the U.S. and our other allies, work very closely and discreetly, as opposed to what previous governments and prime ministers have done, not go to the media, not go to Congress to make speeches, but work very closely in across all the line of uh, the chain of command from bottom to top and worry about the bottom line. And what is the bottom line that we are concerned? Stopping Iran from having nuclear weapons at all costs? I don't know what all costs is, and I don't like speaking about all costs. I like speaking about the, co the, the target. What is it that we want to achieve? And it's not an Israeli issue. And we need to go back to speaking about the fact that Iran as a nuclear state is a problem of the world. It's not an Israeli problem. We need to go, in, to go back to having the international community working towards preventing from Iran having a nuclear weapon because it is a hazard for world peace, for stability of the region. It's not an Israeli issue and it should be dealt as an international issue. We saw already Prime Minister Bennett in the summer going to the White House to meet President Biden. We just saw a visit by Rob Malley, the president's envoy for Iran here in Israel. Do you feel that there is a good line of communication right now between this government and the White House on Iran? I think there's good communication between this government and the White House, period, on everything. And that is exactly how it should be. The relationship with the US is a major Israeli strategic interest, and that we should go back to investing in it. Going back to investing in bipartisanship, one of the major assets that we used to have for so many years and is now sort of has been shaken and we need to go back to investing in that, exactly in that. So when you look today at the situation in Congress, we saw over the summer the uh, crisis that was then solved over Iron Dome. You're concerned that we're looking at more hazards like this along the way? It's not, you know, it's not um, a specific national security per se when it comes to weapons or to arms or anything of the sort. It's about the relationship. It's about sharing the same values, working together towards what we, uh, I think both countries are invested in, democracy, a more just society. Yes, peace and security, but not only, again, for Israel, but for, we have many partners that need to be concerned about that, and that is something that U.S. and Israel should be working on together. How can this government bring back the uh, perception that Israel is strongly committed to bipartisanship? Because there has been criticism in Washington in recent years that at least under the previous government, Israel was seemingly taking sides in American politics. Um, I was, you know, uh, 
part of this Up front criticism. talking about this. Uh, certainly, and uh, I think it's very clear today in this government that bipartisanship is an asset that we must restore and must invest in. I think it's very, very clear. We have a, um, a president who is a very strong Israel supporter. There's a state of Israel that understands the relationship's importance. And again, it's a, it's a matter of political will. And the political will in this government is certainly there. What about the relationship specifically with the American Jewish community? Because you guys also took office after a long period when that relationship was cracking. And we saw a lot of anger coming from the American side about some decisions that were made here and others that were made and delayed, like for example, the Western Wall compromise. Exactly. What kind of change can we expect on that front? First of all, labor took deliberately, we took upon ourselves this ministry that is, uh, we don't like it to call the, the, the it... Diaspora affairs. Yes, we don't like to call it diaspora, we like to call it the global Jewish world, actually. I, I actually, I, I like the, the reasoning you present here. Yes, it, no, completely. It's a global Jewish world out there that we feel re a strong relation to, and we want to enhance this connection with them. And this is why we took it upon ourselves, and we uh, have Nachman Shai, who has so much um, um, uh, experience and also really is invested in this very strongly. So one of the things that we are pushing forward, and it's part of our uh, coalition agreement, is the um, Western Wall compromise. To go it back is to a it. compromise. It is not what I think should be taking place in the Western Wall, but at least this compromise must be pushed forward. We are already working on a resolution that will be, um, I, I hope, passed in the government. You see the other partners going along with this, with you guys? I heard Lieberman, uh, Lieberman's commitment to it. I heard Lapid's commitment to it. And as I mentioned, we are signed in a coalition agreement with uh, Lapid on that. So I see no, and also I have to tell you, Amir, I really see none of the uh, partners to this government opposing such a compromise. Mm -hmm. It is so um, long overdue that it really, it's up to us to make it happen now. We'll obviously keep uh, watching because it's a major priority for a lot of our readers. I want to ask you now on the Palestinian arena, um, we are looking right now at an interesting situation where there are different voices within the same government. And obviously that also reflects on Washington. For example, the debate about the American consulate in Jerusalem. How do you square that circle? You know, labor, uh, I decided that we, uh, our partners for forming this government, uh, not lightly, because I knew that this will not, this will probably not be the government that will bring about the uh, much needed solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. At the same time, my commitment is to make sure that this government uh, does not allow to preclude a future solution with the Palestinians. And this is what we must work for constantly. So we must find constantly a compromise within the government that allows us, on one hand, unfortunately, to maintain a uh, quote unquote status quo, and it, on the other hand, maintain it, so we maintain a prospect for a future solution. So at least the door is not shut. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. we, keep, we must keep the door open for a future arrangement with the Palestinians. This is a national security interest for Israel. It's uh, for its future, for its uh, sustainability, for everything. We are committed to that and we will continue working for it. That's in the long term. On the day-to-day -day level though, we do see that there has been some, I don't want to say tension, but at least discussion openly with the Americans about some of the practical arrangements, whether it's the consulate, whether it's building in the settlements, do you feel there is pressure to see a different course coming from Washington right now? I, I never expect foreigners to put pressure on us to do the right thing. I, and an Israeli legislature and an Israeli minister, I do, certainly do not uh, turn to others in order to help me to do what needs to be done. I have spoken loudly and clearly against building in the settlements. This is something that this government should not be doing. This government, again, will not evacuate anyone, but cannot expand settlements and cannot endanger Israel's future regarding a future solution with the Palestinians. 
What about opportunities? We're talking about threats and dangers, but there are also opportunities in the region. Do you expect the administration with this government maybe to expand on what we saw beginning under the previous American administration, the Abraham Accords, maybe add other countries to the mix? The potential is huge. The potential is there. Um, you mentioned the Abraham Accords, yes, with, of course, uh, countries and states that are far away from us and yet again very interesting in, very interested in the relationship and the joint interests. But I am focusing on the potential that we have here, Egypt and Jordan. Next door neighbors. Next door neighbors whose um, uh, relationship that we have with them and that we have had and the agreements that we have with them are foundations to Israel's uh, national security these days. Now, the previous prime minister has alienated Jordan and damaged the relationship with it dramatically. I am working very much in order to use whatever tools we have to enhance and to strengthen uh, those relationships and this, this connection. And in the transport ministry, thankfully, I have many ways in which I can and I will be doing this. Can you give, this is something that I think to many of our viewers is uh, unrecognized. Can you give one or two practical examples, short, <laughs> that uh, uh, demonstrate the potential here? There are, first of all, you know, we are, as you said, they're neighbors, you know, we can, uh, Transportation is part of national, maybe we need to um, start by saying how uh, transportation is part of national security in the sense that national security is only, not only about I army. Think President Biden with his infrastructure package would agree with you. Maybe this is the, the talking point he's been uh, looking for. Exactly. So certainly transportation is part of national security and certainly when it comes to relationship with neighbors. It's about not only uh, about getting from one place to another safely and um, effectively, and not only about being able to move um, whatever commerce and stuff around, but about being able to get to where, where we want in life. And what we want to, when, where we want to get in life is having a strengthened relationship, a fruitful relationship with our very close partners and neighbors, so we can help the stability of the region, so we can help the um, future potential for more relationship, and of course, for other solutions that we all need so much. One issue that for a lot of supporters of Israel abroad, especially in the United States, has been a top priority in recent years is BDS, the prospect of boycotts on Israel, uh, isolations of Israelis in all kinds of arenas. Where do you think the government can bring a change on that front? What should we uh, try to do in order to address this problem and maybe do differently than previous uh, politicians who try to deal with it? Yet again, one of the reasons why we took the Ministry for Global Jewish World and for uh, the relationship with outside world, the world outside of Israel. There are two things. One is explaining things differently, and the other is doing things differently. Which, which component is more important in dealing with the threat? Both of them are extremely important, and I think it's very clear already that this government speaks in a very different language, without hatred, without incitement, without violence. It tries to find compromises all the time. It tries to include everyone. And I think the relationship that this government demonstrates towards the Arab society in Israel, for instance, the huge money that's being invested now. And having in, an uh, Arab party is a member the of coalition. the coalition. For the first time ever, an Arab, an Arab party is part of the coalition. It's something that really you cannot exaggerate in its importance. I think both internally, first and foremost, of course, for the state of Israel, but also as something that really shows, I think, to the outside world that this is a government government that really sees things and does things differently. And um, maybe also a different image in that sense. Yes, both. But, but specifically, for example, one thing that happened is that uh, the government uh, shut down the strategic affairs ministry that was supposed to deal with it. You think in retrospect, after a few months, this was the right decision? The strategic sort of whatever ministry was um, a political invention. The ministry that is supposed to deal with it is the foreign ministry and the global Jewish um, world ministry. Those are the uh, ministries that have to deal with that. And I 
am certain that they will be doing it. At least one I know that will be doing it much better now. The, the one we'll, 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 we'll have to, to wait <laughs> and see. The one that's under my and our responsibility. Merav Michaeli, Minister of Transportation, member of the Security Cabinet and chairwoman of the Israeli Labour Party. Thank you very much for joining us today for the conference. Pleasure being here and good luck. Hello everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on the future of the alliance between the United States and Israel. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. It's a great pleasure for me to be moderating this panel discussion, featuring some of the leading experts on the US-Israel relationship. Over the past decade, there have been many ups and downs in US-Israel relations. The relationship has swung from the bickering and backbiting between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu to the bromance between President Trump and Netanyahu. How are US-Israel relations changing under the Biden administration and the bennett lapid government? And what challenges to the relationship will President Biden and Prime Minister Bennett have to contend with? Of course, it's not only these two leaders who will shape US-Israel relations over the next few years. The US Congress will also play a key role in this relationship. In that respect, Democratic members of Congress, currently in the majority in the Senate and the House, will be in the spotlight, as attention has focused on progressive Democrats who have been outspoken in criticizing Israel and are increasingly willing to apply pressure on Israel's government. Will there continue to be strong bipartisan support for Israel in Congress, as there has been for decades now? The future of American support for Israel won't only be determined on Capitol Hill and in the White House. The opinions of ordinary Americans will also shape the extent and nature of this support. Are Americans just as supportive of Israel as they've been for decades? Or is American public opinion towards Israel changing? And if so, how? Historically, no group of Americans has been as supported and as invested in the US-Israel relationship as Jewish Americans have been. But for some time now, their attitudes have been changing towards Israel and their criticisms of its government's policies have been growing. How will this development impact the US-Israel relationship? To answer these critical questions, we have an extremely knowledgeable panel I'm delighted to now introduce. Ambassador Martin Indyk is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a former US ambassador to Israel, Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs and Special Assistant to President Clinton. Ambassador Indyk also served as President Obama's Special Envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations from July 2000 to June 2004. He is the author of Innocent Abroad, an intimate count of American peace diplomacy in the Middle East, the co-author of Bending History, Barack Obama's foreign policy, and his latest book is Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Congressman Robert Wexler is the president of the S. Daniel Abraham Center for Middle East Peace in Washington, D.C. He was a Democratic member of Congress from 1997 to 2010, representing Florida's 19th district in the House of Representatives. During his time in Congress, Congressman Wexler served as a senior member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and a member of the Middle East Subcommittee. In 2008, he served as an advisor on Middle East and Israel issues to President Obama during his presidential campaign. And in 2012, he addressed the Democratic National Convention outlining President Obama's policies towards Israel. Professor Shibli Telhami is the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He regularly conducts public opinion polls in the Arab world, Israel, and the United States. Among his many publications are The World Through Arab Eyes, Arab Public Opinion, and The Reshaping of the Middle East, The Peace Puzzle, America's Quest for Arab-Israeli Peace, and The Stakes, America in the Middle East. And finally, Dr. Shira Efron is a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, a special advisor on Israel with the RAND Corporation, and a policy advisor with Israel Policy Forum. And Dr. Efron's research focuses on US policy toward the Middle East. So I'd like to begin uh, by asking Ambassador Indyk, uh, first of all, what do you think the impact uh, of the Biden administration and the bennett Lapid government will be on US-Israel relations? Do you think the honeymoon period is now over and that tensions between the two sides are beginning to surface? And if so, can these tensions be kept behind 
closed doors, as both sides seem to hope. Thanks, Dov, and I'm delighted to be uh, with you for this uh, discussion with my friends. Uh, you know, tension in relations between states is uh, not something that should be considered a gewalt type situation. Um, it happens on a regular basis. Just look at the tensions we've had between the United States and France uh, recently. Uh, and it particularly happens between the United States and Israel from time to time because of the nature of uh, the circumstances in which each country finds itself. Israel is a small, although now powerful state in a uh, volatile region. Uh, and the United States is a superpower that has interests across the globe. Uh, inevitably, the priorities of each are going to be different from time to time. And the notion that there can be no daylight between the United States and Israel is a fiction uh, created by, I think, people who wanted to uh, make it uh, unacceptable for the United States to pursue its own interests and, and only to follow Israel. So uh, I just think that's unrealistic. It's, it, there's no historical precedent for such a thing. And, and we shouldn't assume that the relationship will break just because there are differences from time to time. The question is how to manage them. So even though you have uh, within the Lapid uh, Bennett uh, government on the one side and the and the Biden administration on the other, a desire to uh, get past the tensions uh, that that characterise the relations between previous democratic administrations and Likud governments, that is to say, more liberal uh, democratic administrations and more right-wing Likud governments. Uh, today, you know, I think there's, there's a desire both to to avoid uh, those kinds of tensions and to rebuild a more positive and constructive relationship. But there are going to be differences today. There's a difference over the question of reopening the US consulate in Jerusalem, for instance. And, and we should expect that, that uh, there will be some tension over that. There'll be tension inevitably over settlement policy. There always has been, always will be, because that's against US interests. And yet uh, uh, successive Israeli governments of left and right, not just, just this hybrid version, uh, continue to pursue settlement activity. So, uh, I, you know, I think that, that we're going to see overall a better way of dealing with the problems because both sides are committed to trying to work together uh, as opposed to under Netanyahu, who was looking to pursue a, par a partisan approach, appealing to the Republicans at the expense of the Democrats. Clearly, Lapid and Bennett are not interested in that kind of approach. They're much more focused on bipartisanship. And so I think that overall, uh, the relationship will um, be strong, positive, and, and uh, that will create a, a much better context for dealing with the inevitable strains and differences that will arise. Thank you. So in many ways, the um, the, the harmonious uh, period between President Trump and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was the aberration rather than the, the rule of US-Israel relations. Um, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Congressman Wexler. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, um, Ambassador Indic used the word gewalt, there's been a lot of gewalt yeah, recently over um, attitudes toward Israel in Congress, and particularly within the Democratic Party. And a kind of, con a, you know, a fear that Democrats are, are turning against Israel. Um, what do you make of this claim? I mean, how do you see trends, if anything, both within Congress, but spe specifically within the Democratic Party? Sure, um, and thank you for having me. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any legitimate fear, as you say, in terms of Democrats um, somehow moving away from Israel. And the vote uh, most recent in the House of Representatives regarding additional funding for Iron Dome was overwhelming, um, both Republicans and Democrats supporting uh, roughly a billion dollars of additional funding for a defensive uh, uh, missile defense system for Israel. Having said that, though, 
for those of us who care deeply about the American-Israeli relationship and the crucial bipartisan foundation of that relationship, there is a change in the debate, um, particularly amongst the Democratic Party and largely uh, forced to the service uh, to the surface by a group of progressives within the party. And what is that debate? I, I would suggest the debate is anchored in the realization that no longer is a negotiated two-state solution an assumed outcome. And that is a product of both Israelis and Palestinians to, to a certain degree moving away from an assumption of a negotiated two-state outcome and also failures of uh, repeated efforts to reach uh, conclusions. And to a certain degree, the Trump administration, for the first time, any Republican or Democratic administration, overtly moving away from a negotiated two-state outcome as the preferred goal. So Democrats are in this awkward position. <clears throat> we used to know what we were for when it came to Israel. We were for a robust security relationship with our strategic ally. We were for a negotiated two-state outcome that would ensure that Israel would remain democratic and a Jewish majority um, and secure. But now we no longer know that a two-state outcome um, is viable. So Democrats don't know necessarily what they're for, but to a large degree, they know what they are uncomfortable with. And as Ambassador Indyk pointed out, many Democrats, Republicans too, are uncomfortable with a unbridled settlement policy. To a certain degree, people are uncomfortable at certain aspects of a uh, housing demolition policy in Israel that appears at times to be harsh um, or directed in an improper direction. And generally speaking, Democrats, although Republicans also, but Democrats tend to be more vocal about rights. And when they perceive that there may be a deprivation or an inequality of rights, they will speak to that. But the good news is, and this is what I think is the overriding <clears throat> message, the good news is, is that the Biden administration has an opportunity to define quite clearly what Democrats, what Americans should be for relative to Israel and particularly relative to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And what we should be for at this point is improving conditions, improving lives for Israelis and Palestinians alike, and where we can to narrow the political differences between the two parties. That's what we can do today to build a two-state reality in the absence of diplomatic or political progress. We can do it by creating territorial contiguity, more territorial contiguity for Palestinians, transportation contiguity for Palestinians. The Israeli government, the new government, has already started issuing more work permits. They've recognized inside Israel some Bedouin towns very important messaging. <clears throat> and they've also devoted um, millions, hundreds of millions of funding to Israeli Arab uh, communities inside Israel also. Very important messaging. And the Israeli Supreme Court offered a constructive uh, compromise with respect to the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. The real opportunity, and I'll close with this, is taking the extraordinary opportunity of the Abraham Accords, negotiated, of course, to the credit of the Trump administration, but taking the normalization process and including the Palestinians in it in a way that they've not been included thus far. And it is not difficult to imagine with a good deal of American diplomatic effort that we could be entering into a time where we have constructive business relationships between Israelis and Palestinians and Emiratis and Moroccans and business people from Bahrain in Israeli controlled areas of the West Bank that open up new opportunities. Just this last week, we had a military exercise between the United States, Israel, Bahrain, and the UAE. A wonderful, wonderful, in my view, 
message to Iran of solidarity, but also this exercise of strength should allow the Israeli government, the United States, and our partners in the region to include the Palestinians in the good news in terms of the benefits of the Abraham Accords. Thank you. Um, I want to return to some of those policy measures in a moment, but uh, I'd like to widen the focus now out from, from inside the Beltway and the kinds of policies that the United States can adopt to think about uh, public opinion uh, in the United States. And I want to turn to Professor Telhami, who's uh, studied American public opinion so extensively. Um, do you see American public support for Israel as fundamentally stable um, or do you see it shifting? And if so, um, what kind of trends are you observing in, in the survey data that you collect? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for hosting me. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, really uh, pleased to be uh, with my colleagues on this uh, panel. Um, let, let me put it this way. Um, there has been a continuing, in, in some cases, really dramatic shift in American public opinion, mostly among Democrats, but now also among young evangelicals, surprisingly, that's far more critical of Israel and more sympathetic with the Palestinians. Uh, but before I give you some examples, I want to make two points. Um, the first is that the principal reason why this shift in public opinion remains less visible on official Washington and why the gap between public opinion and elected officials remains wide is that Israel-Palestine is not now anywhere near a priority for anyone but lobbyists focused on this issue. And even normally, public opinion, of course, is only one factor in the American political process, often trumped by other factors, uh, especially camp large campaign contributions. But the second point I want to make is that the proposition that it's only progressives who have grown more critical of Israel and U.S. policies that are uncritically supportive of Israel is inaccurate, at least at the level of public opinion. Uh, the shift is far broader, especially among Democrats, uh, in some cases overcompassing large majorities. And let me just give you some examples before I end. The first is that in the public opinion polling that we've been doing, now more Democrats want the US to take the Palestinian side than the Israeli side, by, a, a, by the way, by a ratio of two to one right now, and even higher among Democrats under 35. Though most still want the US to uh, take neither side. A second finding is that more Democrats blame Israel for the May Gaza fighting than blame the Palestinians. Uh, this is something that followed the, the Gaza war. And, uh, and in fact, we also found that more people, especially young uh, Democrats who are unsatisfied with the way Trump, uh, with the way Biden reacted to that war with, with about half Democrats really being uh, unapproving of the way Biden handled the Gaza crisis. Uh, um, overwhelmingly, uh, 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 you know, uh, Democrats and even most Republicans favor a democratic Israel, even if it no longer is a Jewish state, according to our polls, over a Jewish Israel that's not democratic. And for years, by the way, our polls have found that most Democrats uh, support U.S. sanctions or tougher measures against Israeli settlement. You, you know, Robert mentioned the, the, the consensus opposition to settlements, but it's not just consensus opposition. It's really even supporting the U.S. taking drastic measures to stop settlements, which certainly has not been reflected in our political process mm -hmm. and certainly not in Congress. Um, overwhelmingly, Democrats and most others, including Republicans, uh, oppose laws that punish boycotts of Israel, uh, principally due to concerns uh, about civil rights. Uh, and by the way, even on BDS, uh, where less than half of Democrats had ever heard of the movement, nearly half of those who had heard uh, of the movement say that they support it, and fewer than 20% oppose it. Uh, overwhelmingly, Democrats who have heard of BDS think it's a illegitimate movement, even more than three quarters. And finally, um, 
more than two thirds of Democrats and most Republicans think it's acceptable or even it is a duty of their elected uh, representatives in, in Congress uh, to question the US Israeli relationship. Um, and these are just a few of the, of the findings that we have had in recent years. And this has been continuing. We've seen the erosion of, of support and more criticism of Israel uh, and, and more support of, of harsher measures uh, against Israeli policies uh, over, over the years with the, the one that we've done after the Gaza war was especially uh, strongly critical of Israel. So the bottom line is, um, as you could see from those examples, uh, this goes well beyond progressive, certainly at the level of public opinion. And when the Israeli-Palestinian issue rises in the public priorities, it isn't now, as you know, I mean, not and understandably, what, either it's for the Biden administration, for the public, or, or for Congress. But when it does rise uh, in the attention of the public, as it did in uh, during the Gaza fighting uh, in May, um, then even U.S. officials in Congress, including those who are typically pro-Israel, become more critical. And, and, and so critical, in fact, it lost May that it may have surprised the Democratic President Biden, uh, who was uh, really uh, must have been, uh, you know, struck by the fact that the uh, that the criticism of his posture of not being critical enough of what was happening or making taking initiative to stop it was coming from mainstream Democrats in Congress. So, yes, I think that there has been a big shift. And one reason we don't see it is that this is not a priority issue right now. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to turn to Dr. Efron. Um, Professor Tahami was describing this broad shift that's taken place in Israeli public opinion. Um, in there's been a shift uh, in American public opinion. There's been a shift in American Jewish opinion for some time toward more critical attitudes, uh, still strongly supportive of Israel, but uh, differentiating between that and, and supporting Israeli government policies. Um, do you think that American Jews are still Israel's most important ally in the United States or have evangelical Christians, Professor Talhavi mentioned, have they been supplanted by evangelical Christians? And if so, what does this mean for the US-Israel relationship going forward? Does it mean that you know, Israeli governments will just pay more attention to the views of evangelical Christians than uh, Jewish Americans, as, as some argue uh, Netanyahu's governments did? Um, thank you. Dov, uh, for this question. Great to be here with such uh, terrific experts. And Dov, you're yourself an expert on these issues. Um, I'll speak maybe a little bit, uh, continue where, they, where uh, Shibley uh, stopped and, and uh, pick on uh, U.S. Jews. But if, if you allow me, I'll also want to um, just dive a little bit into the numbers on how Israeli Jews, and I'm just going to speak about Israeli Jews, even though 21% of the population are of Palestinian descent, uh, because it's interesting to see how both sides look at each other. Um, and I think it's interesting because there are the policy issues that, you know, Martin and uh, Rob spoke about, and there are the more public opinion issues. So when we look at American um, Jews, it's, uh, and Shibley is the expert on pu American public opinion, but my understanding it's a different um, group to survey for a variety of reasons, which we don't have to get into now, it's getting into the weeds. But if we're looking at polls, what we are seeing is the majority of Jews, obviously, we're seeing it in uh, voting patterns. The majority of Jews obviously vote for the Democratic Party. And also still, for the most part, uh, they remain pro-Zionism. Uh, not unconditional with criticism, but still support the idea of Zionism. And we can um, unpack what this actually means today. But that's what we're finding in the polls. But let's break it down for a second. If we're looking at the growing subpopulations within the Jewish community in the U.S. There are the ultra-Orthodox, orthodox, which I'm sorry, in surveys, I don't see the differentiation between modern and ultra-Orthodox. That's 10% of the population, but it's the fastest growing uh, part. And those are actually, uh, I think, uh, not, not always has been the case, but now they're predom predominantly uh, Republican, conservative is obviously more religious. Uh, so they're, they resemble Israeli uh, conservatives on one hand. Um, the other group that is, is growing is and consists of 30% of the Jewish population is what they call the unidentified. It's, you know, you don't relate to a certain uh, stream of, of 
Judaism, neither reform or orthodox or conservative. Um, we're seeing more young people uh, in this group. And this connects to the trend that the younger you are, you're also more liberal and progressive. And uh, as part of intersectionality and whatever the reason is, you have less affinity to Israel, uh, either just like negative views on Israel or just indifference. Um, and there's a growing, I think, tension between this idea of being liberal and also being pro-Zionism. And this was, if, the, if these two trends continue, at least with, with, with the big uh, group, this will, uh, this will remain in the future. Now, we have to speak about it because there was a change in government now in Israel, and, and Martin started with it. The last 12 years, I think the damage that Netanyahu did to ties, uh, uh, and we can go into the specific examples, uh, you know, left a, left a serious mark, and we know that by design, his government uh, turned is wanted to turn Israel into a partisan issue and prioritized uh, conservative evangelicals over what they call liberal Jews. And for those of you on listening and who haven't seen the remarkable interview that uh, Netanyahu's ambassador to Washington, Ron Dermer, gave, where he actually admitted it, um, I, this is this is important watching. So what did they did? Probably to right wing and more pro Israel Jews, it pro probably took it to reinforce the belief that they're the ones who really care about Israel, right? And haven't abandoned Zionism. And liberal Jews took it as an affirmation of what they felt uh, all these years, the last decade, that Israel's right wing government has really delegitimized them, betrayed them, uh, uh, forsaken them because they won't support Israeli policies. And the Israels are ungrateful to the diaspora and uh, that Israel is losing its ways. And probably most Americans, uh, most American Jews in the middle probably ask who is Der Ron Dermer. But, uh, you know, this is really uh, the case. So this is where I think the, U the U.S. Jews are. If you have more and more minutes, I'll just tell you, I think Israelis are interesting because across the board, and you see surveys, uh, INSS is an interesting survey that comes out every year, and you see that Israel Israelis... Uh, feel that they're absolutely dependent on the United States. You ask, uh, there's an interesting survey question uh, listing a challenges of what can Israel withstand? And one of the questions is about redu uh, lower US support. And I think 82% um, say that this, this is concern, it's a concerning trend if Israel would lose the US support. But this doesn't push Israelis to think, oh, we have to be better to America. It actually says like, we're so dependent on them, that scares us, so we have to be uh, self-sufficient. <laughs> So it's kind of a paradox in the Israeli responses. And you have overwhelming support for Israeli, Israel having to be uh, independent. Now, when we're talking about the youth, and I think that's the most interesting uh, part, the, uh, whereas we look in the US and in Europe and other parts of the world, and you see young people, let's talk about the age of 18 and over, they're less religious, they're more liberal. Um, in Israel, it's the opposite. Israelis, and we're seeing this across all polls, it's really interesting phenomenon. They're very conservative. They define themselves as right wing. Most of this generation was born after the second intifada. They don't even understand the, 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 the idea of peace and peace process. And they're very, you know, they're really just conservative. And I'll just give you an example. There was um, uh, a, an idea of how do you, it, would you join the, the national Hasbara efforts? And 62% of the Israeli public said that they would join the Hasbara efforts, meaning like uh, doing PR for the state of Israel, which means that they agree with their policies. And with the Israeli youth, this number was closer to 80%. So I guess I'd sum up, and we're probably going to dive into these issues. I think with the new Israeli government that really wants to repair ties and move away from the BB years, and I think also U.S. Jews probably on the other side, have been eager and willing to view this new government as a, chan as a chance to reset ties uh, beyond the Netanyahu era. So I think there's a grace period now. But at the end of the day, it's not just BB, anti-BB. There are uh, fundamental policy issues and differences in values and questions about state and religion. And uh, the two sides don't see eye to eye on these. And I don't know, I don't see any uh, change in those trends. Thank you. So I want to uh, thank you all for your, your really uh, substantial, thoughtful answers. I want to zoom out a little bit now and, and, and ask about a, a premise um, that's often unstated when it comes to discussing U.S.-Israel relations. And the premise is that both sides need each other, that uh, Israel's national interests and America's national interests are served by this strong alliance. 
Um, and I wonder whether that premise is still as true today as it was in the past, whether particularly on the American side, uh, as, a, as the United States is uh, reevaluating its engagement in the, in the Middle East, its interest in the Middle East, whether quite simply there's less at stake for, for the United States um, and, and there, it, it, there's less for it to gain from this kind of very substantial and intense investment in, for example, trying to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Ambassador Indik, do you, do you see a, a, a shift in Americans, America's interests in this relationship? Is it less important than it what you, you've written uh, about Henry Kissinger? Uh, and he obviously used the US-Israel relationship as a way to advance the United States' wider interests in the region. Is that Would that be relevant any longer? Yes, uh, actually, uh, ironically, it, it's uh, kind of as relevant today as it was back in, in Kissinger's day. And, and for a similar reason, uh, Back then, the United States was also in a retrenchment mood uh, coming off the withdrawal from Vietnam and uh, was facing domestic turmoil with the Watergate, Watergate impeachment process. And um, so Kissinger operated in an environment uh, not that different to the one that, that President Biden is operating in today. But uh, the real relevance of Kissinger is that, that he looked uh, to create order in the Middle East that would be based on a balance of power. If you apply that principle today with the United States shifting its focus to Asia and being more uh, concerned about uh, correcting the balance of power in that part of the world, countering a rising China, and therefore having to move resources and attention uh, away from the Middle East, and away from the kind of forever wars in the Middle East, then as a result, it's still the United States still has to be concerned about maintaining order in the Middle East. And that therefore requires the United States to depend upon its allies more than it uh, needed to when it was dominating the region over the last 40 years. And, and uh, therefore, countries like Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, and and uh, the the other Sunni Arab states become, in a way, more important um, as the United States shift to a more kind of offshore balancing approach, where it's supporting its local partners and allies as they maintain a balance of power in favour of of stability and and order. So, in that context, Israel is the most capable. Uh, uh, militarily and and one of the most powerful economies in, in the region uh, becomes uh, more important. Um, but that doesn't mean that the United States writes Israel a blank check. Uh, far from it. What we need and what the Biden administration is telling all of its partners in the region mm -hmm. is we need them to act responsibly. We need them to calm things down quote, unquote. That's the new policy, calm things down. And uh, amazingly, um, they're more or less responding to that. Uh, the kinds of things that, that uh, Bob Wexler talked about uh, in terms of actions taken by the Israeli government are designed to calm things down. The Egyptians are working with Israel in Gaza to calm things down. Uh, we're trying hard to get the Saudis to calm things down in, in Yemen. They don't cooperate so much, but to some extent they are. And we see the Arab Sunni states engaging Iran uh, and, and in the process of, of setting up dialogues with Iran and understandings with Iran, which are also uh, in the service of calming things down. And then the United States is sending envoys to, to Ethiopia and Sudan and, and Yemen and, and Libya with exactly the same purpose in mind. So it, it, you already see uh, the architecture uh, developing of a, of a new uh, uh, regional power-led order in which the United States shift being uh, the supportive power, uh, superpower. Thank you. I want to, I want to extend this question to uh, Congressman Wexler, um, in particular with regards to the US interest in 
um, promoting or, or mediating a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And you've you talked in your previous answer about some of the, the steps that the United States could take in that regard if it if it sets its mind to it. Um, but is it still the case that you know the holy grail of Israeli-Palestinian peace is something that is so important for the US? I mean, if if the United States is able to keep a lid on the situation there, avoid being dragged into a uh, renewed uh, escalation of, of, of violence, um, is it still true that America is will, would be willing to really place its political capital uh, on the line to try to negotiate an agreement? Well, we should be, we should uh, place our political capital on the line. But it, it's not to reach a final status outcome comprehensive agreement. That's where this time is different from the previous times where people like Ambassador Indic and others led very important efforts. No one in Israel not anyone in the Palestinian side, and very few people in Washington are focused on a comprehensive resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What we can do, and what would serve the interests of both Israelis and Palestinians, and I think Americas, is to design progress. Progress that improves conditions, the lives of Israelis and Palestinians, build some modicum of hope, particularly on the Palestinian side, that progress is possible, and in certain ways builds a, a two-state reality to be contrasted from seeking a two-state outcome when politically it's not possible. And I think if we were meeting the United States, to pursue that type of diplomatic approach, number one, we could be successful, which would be something different. Um, but it would also give a great deal of boost to the Palestinian side. The Palestinian private sector has been disproportionately decimated by COVID. Um, uh, the Palestinian Authority obviously is less credible today with its own people than it ever has. The Palestinians need something to hope for. They need real progress. They need to see jobs in their neighborhoods. They need to be able to get in their cars with greater confidence and drive somewhere where it, it's a coherent transportation network. Yes, more job permits to travel into Israel is a positive thing, but that can't be the only answer. The good news is, that there are ideas like connecting the Northern West Bank to the port of Haifa uh, through railroad connections that would give a certain element of Palestinian autonomy um, to, to businesses and to the Palestinian Authority that would change the dynamic. We've had over a decade of failure. It doesn't even matter who's to blame, but we have an opportunity and the Abraham Accords are the backdrop that, that provide a, a somewhat um, encouraging framework. But in fairness, the Palestinians, of course, have not been included and have been largely against the normalization effort. But that's where Democrats, particularly the Biden administration, can provide a different approach that will bring the Palestinians in. If we do that, we will build a different set of realities and in three years, four years, six years, we might be able to talk about something more ambitious. But the most important thing is for the Biden administration not to set out for a comprehensive agreement. That would be a death knell. No, we, we create expectations that are realistic, in my humble opinion, meaning improve conditions and where possible, narrow the political differences between the sides. Thank you. Um, Professor Talhami, um I want to ask you specifically about the impact that you see Palestinians having on American in the on the US debate over Israel Palestine the Israeli Palestinian conflict one of the shifts I think we've observed in recent years is the is a growing number of Palestinian voices being heard in these discussions uh, both Palestinian Americans Palestinians uh, in the West Bank in Gaza um 
in, in, in a way that it's not just uh, the Palestinian Authority or the PLO, or PLO spokespeople who we hear from now. Do you think um, the Palestinian voice is shifting this, this debate and, and maybe challenging some of the uh, conventional wisdom uh, that's, that's governed for so long? A uh, good question, and let me relate it actually to the conversation that was started by Martin and Robert about the strategic picture. Um, if, honestly, yes, of course, there's all these elements, the strategic elements that are important, particularly now as the U.S. disengaging from the Middle East. But the reality of it is that the American relationship with Israel has survived every period, including when the U.S. was present and dominant, including when the U.S. had withdrawn, because Israel... Uh, in the U.S. is uh, as much a domestic issue, me, even more of a domestic issue than it is a foreign policy issue. And let's be clear about that. That is, the relationship is not in the first place going to be determined by strategic calculus. It is going to be determined by the nature of American politics. It is part and parcel. We could, you know, that's another conversation to get into. But that conversation in America is shifting. And it's shifting not because of individual Palestinian voices, no. It is because at the core, while the Palestinian question has strategic consequences for sure, and even after the normalization with the Arab states still resonates in Arab public opinion in a way that's consequential, it is at the core right now a moral issue. Uh, and that moral issue is a big one because it has become a prototype for a lot of people who subscribe to a different uh, a system of values. In America right now, we're uh, certainly divided, but we're not just divided Republican and Democrats, Trumpists and non-Trumpists, it's a value divide. And there is a, a group of people that focus on international law, uh, on uh, social justice, on uh, equality, on anti-racism, uh, on egalitarianism. and and. The question of Palestine, to the extent that it has succeeded in becoming part of this conversation, it has become a prototype of this struggle for a lot of people. So a lot of those uh, Democrats who, are, who want to empathize with the Palestinians are not doing it for strategic arguments. They're doing it because they see the issue of Israel-Palestine right now through the prism of social justice. That's why like Black Lives Matter had such an impact. And even on young evangelicals, as I wrote recently about the transformation among young evangelicals who increasingly see the issue through the prism of social justice, not through the prism of strategic uh, thinking or even biblical thinking. So yes, I think there's that's part of the conversation. Uh, and it's an important part of the conversation. Is it transformative in politics? We all know how politics is done. And as I said, public opinion is only one part of a bigger mix of issues that influence politics, it needs to rise in the priorities. But when it does, we see that it has an impact. Thank you. And um, when we just have time, I think, for another question I want to pose to uh, Dr. Efron, uh, talking about this issue of strategic interests and how much both sides uh, need each other. Do you think on the Israeli side, there is still a consensus that the, United, that the United States is Israel's indispensable ally? Or is American support for Israel now seen as somewhat less important as Israel has strengthened its relations with other great powers and, and rising powers like, uh, like China? Just before that, there was just a lot of talk here about the views on the Palestinian issue in the US. And you have to understand that in Israel, no one thinks, at least the Jewish population, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not an issue that the vast majority of Israelis think about. There was a question recently, and it was very, very subtly uh, nuanced. It's INSS, super, and they used the legal uh, definition of the control of uh, people in Judea and Samaria when they asked the question, and 70% of Israelis do not consider Israel's control of people in territories as occupation, even though this is the legal terminology that is used by in Israel and by the IDF. So this is there's a big disconnect, and this disconnect is going to continue, as I said before. And 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 I I just don't see short of I said this with great sadness, short of uh, sporadic violence that remind Israeli Jews that there is a conflict. <laughs> we this is not something that's on the Israeli radar. When you look at uh, and I mentioned before, on the strategic picture, there's no substitute in Israeli eyes uh, for the United States. 
they know this is, and I mentioned, right, they see that this is one of the uh, concerns would be uh, a lower U.S. support for Israel uh, when there was the Iranian strikes on Saudi Aramco uh, facilities and the U.S. did not intervene on behalf of Saudi Arabia, to which it sells the most sophisticated weapons in the world, so you would think that they might be able to defend themselves. Um, is, there was a question in Israel, and Israelis said, oh, the United States is not going to come to, for, to, to our rescue either, so we have to learn how to defend ourselves. Um, but when you look at after the United States, which other countries are most important for you, Israel will say, I think it's 24% Russia, 22% China, there's Europe. So there's definitely an, uh, uh, a growing perception of it's the U.S. is the most, but there are other countries. And that is uh, important. Um, and, you know, Israel, like many other countries, is, is hedging. Uh, this comes mostly to the great power competition with China. Of course, Israel is mostly to the side of the U.S., but you can't ignore the fact that uh, it's no longer a unipolar world. Thank you. Um, I saw Ambassador Indik, you uh, nodded your head with, with regards to uh, Dr. Efron talking about uh, Israel hedging its policy vis-a-vis -vis China. Do you, uh, do you see it hedging or do you think uh, Israel is firmly uh, aligned uh, behind the United States? Shira is, is right in the way that she put it. Um, but I think hedging is, is overrated, not just for Israel, but, but for the Arab states uh, as well. As much as they recognize that the United States is uh, shifting its focus elsewhere and that they are no longer uh, the subject of our attention and affections and uh, in the way that, that they used to be, uh, the alternatives to depending on the United States for their ultimate security are all uh, suboptimal, let's put it that way. Um, and particularly, that's particularly true of, of China. Uh, and so, yeah, they're looking to see what advantage they can get from engaging with China, um, selling uh, to China, of course, selling oil to China, in Israel's case, selling technology arms uh, and so on to China. But, but in the end, um, they all prefer the United States. And so um, I think that, that you know, the United States uh, will, will be responsive to that. It's not turning its back on the region. Uh, and, but I, I do think that that the adjustment uh, to a uh, the pivot that the United States is engaged in uh, will be less problematic and uh, less of a, of a major change uh, for the United States or the parties in the region. It's just going to be a kind of readjustment of of the balance between the United States and our allies and partners there. Whereas I said they step up and we as we step back. Thank you. So uh, we have very little time. And I want to put you all on the spot for one last uh, quick you know, response. Um, and that's that's the, the future of US military aid for Israel. Um, I, there's going to be uh, in the next few years the need to uh, renew or uh, revise the Memorandum of Understanding, the $38 billion uh, 10 year agreement that the uh, Obama administration uh, signed with Israel. Um, given what we've been talking about, shifts in public opinion, America's changing strategic interests in the region, um, do you see this uh, military aid continuing in the same form, or do you think the next time it comes up, whether $38 billion more uh, or more than that, will be a lot harder sell, a more contentious process than it was last time around? And this is just a very quick just if everybody gives me their, their prediction for how this uh, military aid is going to be handled the next time it comes up. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, uh, Congressman Wexler. Um, the assistance package to Israel will continue. It'll enjoy bipartisan support in the United States Congress. Um, the margins of support will be significant. However, the Israeli government would be wise to take notice as to the changing public opinion and debate, as Shibley rightly points out, and others. And they should take action to create a dynamic of progress. It requires a Palestinian partner. Palestinians have a self-interest to advance that progress now as well. So if there is any element of progress, that assistance and the whole dynamic will actually get even easier. 
Um, the Israeli government should also take notice regarding settlements. And this isn't just the Republican or Democratic Party. It's both parties have a great concern about advancing settlements, particularly settlement building that is not within the um, closer regions around Jerusalem, not in the settlement blocks, but even east of the security barrier that Israel built, that creates more political tension that endangers this kind of smooth sailing for the, the assistance packages, which are well-deserved and in the American interest. Yeah. Um, Professor Talhami, do you... Uh predict that the, uh, the the package will sell through, or do you think the next time around well, is going to be uh, a lot more? Probably it will, but let me just say something, because I think you focused on the money. The money is important. Of course, a lot of money, but that Israel is a wealthy country. It can deal without the money. It's really the technology. It's, it is the cutting edge technology, the edge that Israel has with the Arab, and protection at the UN against international actions that the US is really kind of the buffer zone there. Those are the two that are most critical for Israel. And those two, you know, are could, will be in play. Imagine uh, Bernie Sanders could have been the president of the United States right now. I mean, that was pretty close call. And, and could you have imagined a President Sanders saying, well, I'm going to withhold uh, certain weapons for now, uh, even despite what Congress might, might think, until X, Y, Z? Yes. Can you expect, can can we anticipate another person like Sanders in this democratic environment? Yes. Uh, so I think in the short term, probably no threat as as uh, Robert Wexler has noted, but I think that it's, a, it's an evolving dynamic. Dr. Efron, do you uh, share this um, reasonable uh, confidence? Um, before I go into predictions, which I don't do, I just want to say, because I can get into trouble in Israel if say something about China, I don't think Israel is hedging with China on security, it's on economics. So Israel is 100% as aligned with the US on security issues and does nothing uh, with China on defense issues since there were a few uh, crises we can't get into, uh, probably people here remember, uh, but um, it's the hedging more uh, in lines with what uh, countries in Europe do and not so much countries in the region. So again, I don't do predictions. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I think Shibli uh, spoke about the most important point. And if I were the Israeli government, I would say, listen, it's not Israel that it used to be. More uh, billionaires per capita than any other country. We hear of it one unicorn after the other. We don't need uh, you, US, US, United States of America to pay for military boots. We need access to this technology. And this access is something that I... I don't see Israelis bringing up themselves, but if I were advising the Israeli government, I think this is where the conversation needs to go. Thank uh, you. I just add, Dov, um, I think that, that uh, Israelis would be wise, and I'll shock everybody by saying this, by actually taking, uh, copying a, a play uh, that uh, Netanyahu made when he first became prime minister. He came to Washington and he said, that the United that Israel's economy was such that it could afford to reduce its dependence on American economic assistance, and then engaged in a detailed negotiation. I was involved in it too, in which uh, Israel's economic assistance was taken down to zero. Uh, he very cleverly switched it so that Israel's military assistance was taken up, so it was completely compensated. But as Shibley says, Israel is a strong. Uh, country economically uh, and militarily, and it needs to stand on its own two feet when it comes to its dependence on the United States for for this level of assistance, largest uh, amount of assistance in the world. Yeah, we can make all the arguments about why it serves U.S. interests, and I agree with all of that. But from Israel's point of view, it's time uh, for the relationship to mature in into one that's that, that Israel is less dependent on the United States. I was shocked, actually, that, that uh, Benny Gantz, the defense minister, rushed to Washington to ask for a billion dollars uh, in additional assistance to pay for the Iron Dome uh, uh, replacements after, after a 10-day war. Uh, you know, Israel, I think, should have thought twice about 
doing that. And you can see the way in which it's become a political football in the United States to Israel's detriment. Uh, I, I just think that, that Israel should think about approaching the United States with, with uh, uh, a step-by-step -step reduction in the amount of uh, assistance it gets in return for the kinds of things that Shibley, Shibley and, and Shira were talking about, which is continued uh, technological transfer that's critical to not just to Israel's military edge, but also to a technological edge. Well, I wish we could continue this conversation because it's been fascinating. We've touched on a lot of issues. Uh, I want to thank you all for your uh, insights, your wisdom. Uh, I've learned a lot and I hope everybody in the audience has as well. So thank you all for joining us and, and thank you all for, for being on this panel and for appearing. Thanks so much. And we're with uh, former Defence Minister Moshe Boghi Alon, also former Chief of General Staff of the IDF. Um, Mr. Yalon, we're all hearing now about the attempts to resume the nuclear talks between Iran and the world powers. And there's a general feeling that seven or eight or even ten years of Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran have failed. Iran, as we're being told, is the closest it's ever been to a nuclear weapons capability. Accusations are flying between the current government and leaders of the previous government. What's your take on this? No doubt that Iran has become to be the main generator or instigator for instability in the Middle East. With its fingerprints in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Iraq, undermining the Sunni regimes in the region, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, and, and more. The whole idea is to export, export the revolution, and they need the nuclear umbrella, first of all, uh, to be able to intensify their activities to export the revolution. Uh, I would claim that, uh, you know, I follow the project since the 90s, serving as head of the intelligence, the military intelligence in Israel. Uh, if, if nothing has been done, I believe that will be even in further uh, uh, progress in, in the project. Those they would have had nuclear weapons by now? I'm not sure that they made the decision to have the nuclear weapon, but to become a threshold mm -hmm. nuclear state, they are there. Looking back to the policy in the last uh, decade or so, the main mistake was the withdrawal of the US administration from the JCPOA, which was an historic mistake, the JCPOA. It would have been a very different agreement, but it probably was better than not having the agreement and to allow the Iranians to use the withdrawal as an excuse to go ahead with the project. And now, yes, they are in the closest stage that they have been ever to become a threshold state. So let's just rewind to May 2018, when the Trump administration decided to withdraw from the JCPOA. I think it's fair to say, with, uh, if not pressure, then a lot of encouragement from the Israeli government, from then Prime Minister Netanyahu, that you think was a mistake? Trump. Once they signed the JCPOA, it would have been better to stick with it. It was a mistake, for sure. I claim it even before the decision. I, I published an article about it, a warning that uh, the United States should in hand withdraw from the JCPOA, even trying to have the coalition, which was in the Obama administration, to have the P5 plus one, to have Europe with you, China and Russia on board, which was the case in 2010. They voted for uh, uh, sanctions in the UN Security Council. It is given now. What should have been done now? It's not a lost case. I don't claim this. we are now in, in they crossed the uh, uh, point of no return. I claim that this regime, Khamenei, in two cases in history, when he met the dilemma whether to go on with his rogue activities on the nuclear, as well as the missiles, as well as the proliferation of terror and arms in the region. When he met such a dilemma, his choice was survivability. What should have been done now, this is my recommendation, political isolation of the regime, creating a new coalition in order to reach this uh, objective, crippling economic sanctions, to include China and Russia, 
but it is I possible. Don't, don't seem to be very interested and, in playing. In and this. to have a credible military option. US won, Israeli won. That was the case in 2000, 2012, when Khamenei has to apologize when he decided to be engaged with the great Satan America. I claim it is still possible to reach it, but it is up to the US administration policy, namely US determination not to allow a military nuclear Iran, which is, of course, the Israeli objective, should have been the European objective, no doubt, of the Arab regimes in the region objective, and the United States. It, doesn't, States sound, it doesn't sound that the Biden administration has a credible military, specifically not after the debacle in Afghanistan in August. So far, I'm afraid that you are right, Angel. I'm afraid. You know, not to respond to the Iranian provocations in Iraq. The Iranian provocations against Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Lebanon, you know. But it is not a lost, a lost case. You know, the Middle East has been changed dramatically. There is no israeli Arab conflict whatsoever. There is an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a marginal one. The main problem in the Middle East is a struggle between three radical movements for hegemony in the region. It's not about a Western hegemony or external hegemony. It's between the Iranian Shia regime to export the revolution, to have a Shia Middle East in beyond, the jihadists claiming for Islamic caliphate, and of course Turkey, which claims to have a neo-Ottoman empire led by the Sultan. In this case, all of us, we and the Arabs, are on the same side, on the same boat. This should have been the case with the United States, Europe, and other uh, adversaries in the region, I believe. So basically, David Ben-Gurion's uh, alliance with the peripheries has been inverted, and now the peripheries, except Israel, are, on, uh, are facing Israel and the Arabs together. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And when you see Israel's role in this, so you, you mentioned the, the Biden administration has to be more... Uh, more forceful in presenting or projecting the possibility of a military option. What does Israel do this time? Does Israel remain quiet? Does it shout? Does it resort to quiet diplomacy, clandestine activities? What would be your recommendation for the new government? Holding very big stick and uh, soft talk. Speaking very softly. That's it. And I believe, you know, because when, oh. when you were defense minister, Netanyahu went to Congress to challenge publicly Obama on, on the JCPOA. I I, that wasn't something that you thought was a good idea at the time. I wasn't happy with it because at the end, the relationship between Israel and the United States is a cornerstone in our national security. And we shouldn't fight the Americans. Uh, we should cooperate with the Americans. We should convince the Americans. This is the case now. I believe that the new government in Israel understands it. And that's why we have now all kinds of talks on the very high level, on the military level, intelligence level. It's very, very important. But we don't have the same kind of confrontation between the prime ministers that we had between Obama and Netanyahu. You, you think that's a better case? That's good news. We should be on the same side with the Americans. We might argue. I'm not happy with the Biden administration so far regarding the policy in the Middle East, the disengagement, the withdrawal, the way that we withdrew from Afghanistan. But we have the way, the channels to discuss it and to convince, from my point of view, the Americans not to disengage with the Middle East. If you run away from terror, the terror will reach you. Let's shift our focus a bit closer to Israel's borders, to Syria. You as defense minister was one of, were one of the leaders of what was then a quiet uh, war in, with, in, Iran, uh, sorry, in Syria against Iranian entrenchment there. We've been seeing in the last few weeks uh, almost a love fest between some of the, what we call the moderate Arab uh, regimes, the ones even close to Israel, have started to re-welcome Bashar Assad into their midst, into the Arab family. <coughs> How do you see that panning out? I worry about the new contacts between the Sunni Arab regimes and Iran. It reflects the fact that they understand the United States is not going to play a significant role in the region. It is worrisome. 
regarding Assad, it is given. You know, Syria is not going to be reunified anymore. Now we have in, on, on, on the Syrian soil, the Alawites led by, by, by Bashar al-Assad. We have the ISIS elements all over. We have uh, Turkey on the northern part. We have the Russians uh, deploying over there. And unfortunately, we have the Iranians. So it's an ongoing struggle in which Israel, in a very smart way, we don't allow it. Uh, I'm happy that we have we don't claim responsibility for any activity. After you left the defense ministry, they started to take <laughs> I was very critical to it. You know, you can. But it's now a fact. If this, you want to is, shoot, shoot, don't but we're, but, but we're now 10 years, by now more than 10 years after the, the civil war began in Syria. And, Arab, and we both remember the intelligence assessment saying Assad will be gone within weeks or months. That wasn't Assad, my assessment. Okay, but a lot of the, the intelligence of people who you had appointed we're saying that. And now we know Assad is there for the foreseeable future. Can, can you see a future in which even Israel is, is dealing with him, like the Emiratis and the, and, and the Jordanians now are? The main objective and the, main, and the interest of Israel as well as the Arab regimes, not to allow Iranian presence in, in Syria. And if uh, Assad is there... Despite everything that's happened in the last 10 years and the hundreds of thousands of deaths under his regime. In the end, you know, there was an opportunity to Obama at the time uh, to attack Bashar al-Assad. And uh, it was the red, the red line. zigzagging as yeah. the red line. It was and another mistake, you know. The U.S. strategic posture in the Middle East has been harmed in many cases. Not uh, responding to Houthi's attack against uh, U.S. S. Mason, a, a, a U.S. Navy yeah. a, a frigate. Recently, not uh, responding to, to Mercer Street. Iranian militias, uh, UAVs attacking uh, the uh, U.S. deployment in Tanef, as an example, or the Green Zone in Iraq to include, uh, try to assassinate uh, Prime Minister Khatami. If you don't uh, uh, respond in, in a way, in an aggressive way, you might be seen as very weak. And in the, the end, the Iranians will have more provocations as a result of it. And into that vacuum, which, which is being left by, you say, the American posture no longer being as forward projecting as it used to be, has come Russia. And that happened on your watch, Russia deployed to Syria. Do you think this has changed the balance here, or it's not a it's not a major deployment by the Russians? It still is something small just to keep Assad uh, on their side. It changed the balance in in, in Syria to keep. Uh, but do you see Assad in a more? But regarding our interest, you know, we have found a way to coordinate the activities with Russia. It happened in my. Uh, watch as a defense minister when I realized on September uh, 2015 that they are going to be deployed. I called uh, defense, the Shrego. Russian defense attaché to my bureau in Tel Aviv, and I said, you have your own interest, we have our interest, we are not going to harm yours, don't harm our interest, and, and it works. As you know, till now there is a channel for coordination uh, between our headquarters and the Russian headquarters. In, in Syria, you know, in many, it is so complicated. I, I'm not sure that the Russians want Iranian presence in, in, in Syria. So we share a couple of common interests with the Russians as well. So very quickly, because we're almost out of time, you mentioned the, the fact that there's no Israel-Arab conflict, there's an Israel-Palestinian conflict, and that's, you said, almost a side issue. But we saw in May how, with Gaza in, in flames, East Jerusalem, and many of the mixed cities within Israel were being gripped by violence, that this side issue can suddenly gra gr grasp the agenda back again. You're not, uh, you're not concerned by that? You think that that's going to remain a side issue? I'm concerned, but uh, this is not existential threat for the state of Israel. And I don't want to go to what has happened in May. In many cases, I claimed, claimed and claimed that uh, our behavior allowing to the Israeli extremists to act in Sheikh Jarrah, in uh, Temple Mount, uh, in the uh, cities like Lod and Acre and, and Tiberias, 
So I believe that Israel is strong enough to deter Hamas, to deter Hezbollah. But you know, the main, uh, the epicenter, the core for instability is still in Iran. And but you said that you used the word existential. Is there an ex existential threat to Israel? Or is even Iran, because that was part of the argument, perhaps the core of your argument with Prime Minister Netanyahu, how existential a threat is Israel facing? Are there any existential threats left? Today there is no existential, external existential threat to, to the state of Israel. But if Iran will have a nuclear, military nuclear capability, it will be a new Middle East, not in the right way and not for our interest. That's why the Israeli objective have been, should have been, should be not to allow a military nuclear Iran by all means. Moshe Elon, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for thank you. watching. Thank you to the UCLA YNA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and Hararetz for hosting me. It's an honor to take part in this conversation with so many distinguished colleagues. This forum should remind all of us that the United States and Israel are bound together by so much more than official diplomatic relations and national security interests. It is our shared values and our vibrant democratic institutions like our excellent public universities and an empowered free press that ultimately unite our two countries. Our bond is built atop a collective desire to continually strengthen our societies, to build brighter futures for our children and our children's children, and to create a more just and humane world. Look, we all know that democracy can be messy at times whether it's administering free and fair elections or passing new budgets or advancing a lasting legislative agenda that ensures government delivers for all of its constituencies, the enterprise of democratic self-government is rife with challenges. But we also know democracy is humanity's best hope for achieving a brighter future. Just as the Biden administration has put together the most diverse cabinet in U.S. history, one that represents voices of those who have never had a seat at the table at the highest levels of our government. So too has this Israeli government put together what I believe is the most diverse coalition government in its history. I am not so naive as to suggest these alliances make the work of governing any easier, but I do believe the work that does get done is more lasting and meaningful when it serves the aspirations of as many of its people as possible. So allow me to congratulate the Israeli government on passing your first budget in three years. As most of you know, our democratic majority is knee deep in negotiations over a historic budget reconciliation bill. And while there's light at the end of the tunnel, the road is full of twists and turns. What matters is that we never forget that progress is always possible. At the same time, we are all too aware that in free and democratic societies, there are those who seem fixated on stalling progress, who insist on being the loudest voice, even if they represent the smallest of opinions. Indeed, here in the United States, there are a tiny handful of voices on both sides of the political spectrum who seek to question the relationship, the U.S.-Israel relationship, who do not appreciate the complex history of the region, nor respect the depth of our bond. Well, I am here to tell you to simply look at the facts. This summer, as a terrorist organization devoted to Israel's destruction indiscriminately fired rockets into civilian centers over the summer, the United States Congress overwhelmingly backed Israel's right to self-defense and the U.S.-Israel security relationship that supports it. And we will continue to do so. So while some try to claim otherwise, the U.S.-Israel relationship remains strong and will continue to be strong, especially if we focus on a few overarching elements. First, we will continue doing exactly what you're doing today, building bridges between our two countries, 
embracing the values and institutions that make both our nations so rich. Second, the United States will continue to support the U.S.-Israel relationship and our security relationship. No nation on earth can be accepted to simply accept terrorist organizations on its border calling for its destruction while amassing rocket arsenals. And no matter the conflict, I think we can all agree that the protection of civilian lives must be paramount and that we mourn the loss of innocent life, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, or religions. We will continue supporting the life-saving Iron Dome missile system, which protects civilians regardless of creed or ethnicity. And I am beyond confident that unlike Hamas's barbaric practice of hiding rockets in schools, basements, and in using civilians as human shields, the Israeli military will continue its practices of warning civilian areas of pending operations and going above and beyond to protect civilian lives. We must also build on the regional component of these threats to Israel. As you may know, the House and Senate Foreign Relations Committee have passed versions of a bill to celebrate the historic Abraham Accords and look for ways to continue increasing U.S. support for facilitating more Israeli diplomatic relations with other Muslim-majority countries. In the Senate, in fact, this is happening in real time and potentially working its way to the National Defense Authorization Act as a vehicle. So stay tuned. In May, it was deeply distressing to see the sheer volume of rocket fire from Gaza despite the cordon of its land and sea borders. While I have been heartened to see increased security operation between Israel and its neighbors in the eastern Mediterranean and Red Sea, including Egypt, I believe that the United States can and should do more to improve security cooperation and tackle the maritime and land smuggling routes used by Hamas to illicitly stockpile rockets or component parts. There is also legislation moving that would increase sanctions on those who facilitate support for Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Third, and building on this theme of increasing regional relationships, the United States must continue to coordinate with Israel and other Middle Eastern countries to seriously constrain the threat from Iran. While the United States is set to restart indirect talks with the Iranians later this month in Vienna, I remain skeptical about both the practice and political viability of a return to the JCPOA. I was not, as many of you know, a supporter of the JCPOA in 2015. However, I was also not supportive of the way the Trump administration unilaterally withdrew from the deal without a serious diplomatic path forward in concert with our allies to constrain Iran's nuclear program, to say nothing of its support for terrorism. Unfortunately, Iran's current unacceptable escalation of its nuclear program is exactly what I expressed concern about at that time. History has shown us that multilateral support for sanctions and other pressure is critical. At this point, Iran is so far out of compliance with the terms of the JCPOA and some of the measures under UNSCR 2231 uh, have expired. So I believe we need to look beyond the JCPOA. Senator Lindsey Graham and I have recently been reviving the idea of a regional nuclear fuel bank. While similar efforts may have been tried before, we believe we should be open to any and all kinds of regional diplomatic engagement that could slow Iran's nuclear weaponization efforts and avert a nuclear arms race in an already volatile region. Senator Graham and I continue to work together on this front because we believe that bipartisan support from the United States Congress is critical to the political longevity of any successful multilateral diplomatic effort. Beyond Iran's nuclear program, of course, we must also continue working with Israel and our allies to address Iran's ongoing and growing regional terrorist threats. While we must do so carefully and within the confines of U.S. law, we must find ways to support the people of Lebanon and the Lebanese armed forces. 
Another collapsed state on Israel's border would not only threaten Israel, but the region as a whole. We must continue fighting terrorist elements in Syria and all the ways in which Iran has exploited and fomented the conflict there. Finally, here in the United States, those of us committed to the U.S.-Israel relationship will continue to push back against all those who try to taint it with partisan politics. When rockets are raining down on civilians inside Israel, it is not the time to call for conditioning assistance. Similarly, when young Palestinians express a desire for a brighter future and new leadership, it is not the time to cut critical assistance efforts in full compliance with U.S. laws. We will continue to use our voice and vote at the global stage and at home to push back on misguided and lopsided efforts to delegitimize Israel from stopping the misguided BDS movement from seeping into completely unrelated conversations to speaking out against offensive and ludicrous targeting of Israel by a human rights council whose members remain silent on crimes against humanity in countries just over the border. And we will continue to speak out against the recent resurgence of anti-Semitism and violent white nationalism that undermines the enterprise of democracy whenever and wherever it rears its ugly head. We will continue to facilitate efforts in support of a two-state solution which allows Israelis and Palestinians to live in peace, security, and dignity. And last but not least, we must remain a reliable and honest friend to Israel. We must stand by them when they are under attack, and we must speak the truth. We must find the nuance. We are capable of doing so, and we owe it to our own values and the values that form the basis of that friendship. Leadership matters. I hope to see you all in person at some point in the future. Thank you. Well, that concludes our conference. I hope you've all found it to be interesting, informative and thought provoking. We've heard from a wide range of voices and it's really been a wonderful experience to be part of this special conference. I'd like to again, extend my thanks to Haaretz um, and to encourage you all to uh, view this conference or share it. You can go to Haaretz's website where it'll be available as well as the website of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Thank you all for joining us and hope to see you again next year.